Good morning from Council Chambers. We're live on the web. I believe we'll be starting in just a few moments. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to uh, order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands, and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nikorasu, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Roll call, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. We understand he'll be absent today with notice. Okay, got it. Uh, Councillor uh, Tank. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cardinal. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jens. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, I'll move that the November 7th, 7th, November 7th and 8th, 2023 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The addition of item 7.2, fall 2023 supplemental operating budget adjustment, 2023 to 26 operating budget addendum one, unfunded service packages. Uh, council directed after September 15th. Um, the addition of item 7.6, 2023 fall supplemental capital and operating budget ad adjustments deliberation process. Uh, the addition of item 9.3, confidential legal settlement instructions. Uh, the addition of item 10, uh, motions pending, item 10.1, Edmonton Police Services employee compensation and replacement attachments on item 7.1, uh, the fall 2023 supplemental capital budget adjustment, attachments three and six, item 7.2, the supplemental operating budget adjustment, attachments one and two, and the replacement attachments on item seven, um, 7.3, fall 2023 carbon budget update, attachment one. Second. Second by Councillor Rice, so please vote. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Yes. I'm, I'm in favor. Thank you. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, approval of the minutes. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor <laughs> Sohi. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the October 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 23rd. City Council public hearing, it's more fun to say each day separately on that one. And the October 24th and 25th, 2023 City Council meeting. Need a seconder? Second. Second. Councilor Wright. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, protocol items. Okay, I have a couple of them. I would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge that today is Inuit Day. Edmonton is home to one of the largest communities of Inuit, south of 60th parallel which lies along Alberta's northern border. Today, we celebrate the richness of diverse Inuit cultures and they reflect our shared histories. In Edmonton, our Northwest Ward is named Anurnik, a name meaning breath of life or spirit in the Inuktan language. Inuit elders chose this name to reflect how Tuberculosis took the breath and spirit of many indigenous people in the 1950s and 60s. During that time, but one third of Inuit contracted tuberculosis. Most were flown south, south for treatment in sanatoriums like 
the former Charles Campbell Indian Hospital in Edmonton. Some survived but and were able to return home, but many passed away and were buried far from their homeland, often without notifying their families. We must never forget those who, who, those who were lost. Despite these hardships, Inuit have made and continue to make a positive impact on our city. And by sharing the unique traditions and knowledge, they help build a welcoming and vibrant Edmonton. Today we also celebrate the birth date of the late Eben Hobson Sr., who founded the Inuit <coughs> Circumpolar Council. This council unifies Inuit voices to protect their way of life and advocate for the indigenous rights. As well, they work to develop and encourage long-term policies that safeguard the Arctic environment. Inuit have been speaking out on the issue of climate change for decades. Their voices are a reminder of the importance of taking action to protect and preserve our planet. Edmonton City Council honors the, their resilience, adaptability, and strength. And we remain committed to strengthening relationships with Inuit people and fighting climate change to make a more sustainable environment for all of us. Thank you and happy Inuit Day. And the second one is, it's Indigenous Veteran Day Council Recognition. Tomorrow, November 8th, is Indigenous Veterans Day. This is the very first time the city is recognizing a day for Indigenous soldiers. The city of Edmonton is also hosting an Indigenous Veterans Day ceremony today in City Hall. I encourage you to join us in paying our respects. I am proud the city of Edmonton is hosting this important event. Our city and our country have been shaped by the many contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis soldiers, thousands of whom proudly served during First and Second World Wars, as well as those who continue to serve to this day. As representatives for as representatives of Edmontonians, it is Council's responsibility to take the lead on building a strong relationship between our city and Canada's First Peoples. We do so by working towards becoming better listeners, connectors, advocates, and partners of Indigenous peoples. These individuals selflessly walked alongside their Canadian Armed Forces colleagues, faced the atrocities of war, and proudly defended peace. This is something we should never take for granted. Indigenous veterans did not receive equal acknowledgement and are still advocating for this today. For each year and pledge to never forget, we must remain committed to advancing reconciliation and fighting racism. I encourage all of us here today, at home, wherever you're th throughout Edmonton, to join us in honoring our Indigenous shoulders. We must never forget the lives lost. Thank you. Okay, any other protocol items? No. Uh, select items for debate. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'm going to select 3.8. Uh, sorry, say it again. Oh, sorry, 3.8. Oh my gosh, I need more coffee. 7.8. 7 7.8. 7 7.8. And I will select 9.1 because it must be selected. 7.8. I'll, I'll, I'll let others select other things. 9.1. Okay. Uh, Constant Knack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sovi. I'll select uh, 9.3. 9.3 and 7, 1, 2, 2 and 3 is they're doubled together. 7, 1, 2, 3. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tang. Uh, yes, I'd like to select 7.4. 7.4. 7.4. 
Okay, so we have selected 7, 1, 7, 2, 7, 3, 7, 4, 7, 8, 9, 1, 9, 3. Uh, Councilor, right? Sorry. Um, I guess I'd like to select seven six so we know how to proceed. Seven six. Okay. Anything else? Or is seeing none? Can someone move the balance, please? So moved. Councilor Knack. Second. Councilor Rutherford, please vote. all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, can you please read us back what we have approved? Thank you, Mayor Sohi. So this morning, City Council has approved the following two reports. Item 7.5, the Edmonton Heritage Council, the annual report to City Council, and 7.7, .7, the increase to short-term promissory note program. It also approved the following in-camera report, 9.2, the YMCA Child Minding Services Agreement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, request to speak, we do have one, but we, uh, as a tradition, do not hear from members of public at, uh, at council unless there are very exceptional circumstances. So I would suggest that we continue to follow that, uh, that practice. Uh, request for specific time on the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, uh, I'll move that the following items we dealt with at a specific time on the agenda. Item 7.4, anti-racism, uh, the strategy implementation update. That will be first item of business on Wednesday, November 8th. And item 9.1, uh, the pre-budget submissions verbal report. That will be the second item of business on Wednesday, November 8th. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Rice, so please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Vote on bylaws not selected for day debate. Councillor Conrad. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will move first reading of items 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So please vote. all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move second reading of items 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of items 8.2, 8.3, and 8.4. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20625, bylaw 20658, bylaw 20629, and bylaw 20638. Second. Thank you. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. A 
I'm not sure what. That is carried. Okay. Any consular inquiries? No. Report to be dealt with at a different meeting? None. Request to reschedule reports? None. Unfinished business? None. Now we are on to uh, public reports, which uh, will go to 717273, cross-referenced, and I will explain the process. Uh, that today marks the beginning of the fall 2023 capital and operating budget adjustment. Deliberation will continue later this month. Before we begin, I will explain the process that Council will use to deal with the three budget-related items on today's agenda. Item 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3 were cross-referenced at the direction of the Agenda Review Committee to support agenda management. Administration will deliver three separate presentations, one for each of the operating budget, capital budget, and carbon budget. In this order, after each presentation, members of council will be permitted to ask one round of clarifying questions on each budget. I encourage my co colleagues to focus their questions exclusively on the budget that is being presented and to reserve additional or follow-up questions for the, for, for the city council budget meetings that start November 21st, 2023. This, this will help us complete our agenda in a timely manner, while also preserving multiple days for more robust discussion on, their budget, on the budget adjustments later this month. After receiving all three presentations and facilitating one round of clarifying questions for each budget, Council will postpone consideration of the Supplemental Capital Operating and Carbon Budget Adjustments to November 21st, 2023 City Council Budget Meeting. At this time, I would invite administration to deliver their first presentation on the Operating Budget Adjustments. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Council. Uh, the team is here to review the recommended 2024 to 2026 adjustments for the capital operating budgets and will also provide an update on the carbon budget. In addition to our executive team and other branch managers, I'm joined here with Stacey Padbury, our DCM and Chief Financial Officer, Jody Graham, Director of Budget Planning and Development, Felicia Muthiardi, Corporate Economist, and Alberto Altim Altimirano will join us later for the carbon budget uh, presentation. Budget 2023-26 provided for increased affordable housing, increased transit service, energy transition and climate adaptation initiatives, as well as major construction projects like the Valley Line West LRT, the Lewis Farms Rec Centre, the rehabilitation of the High Level Bridge in Horlack Park, and the Yellowhead Freeway con conversion. Adjustments are the necessary recalibrations we make to ensure that the 23 to 26 budget supports Edmonton in its evolving context. Now we know that Edmontonians are experiencing an affordability crisis. The city of Edmonton is also navigating inflationary pressures and the steady post-pandemic recovery of our public services. Just like a household, our base costs do the same type of work, are, due to the same type of work are increasing. Utility costs have continued to rise and this increase is particularly significant, significant given the sheer volume of buildings we have here in the city. Revenue shortfalls in transit have added to the budgetary challenges. These shortfalls, along with the operating impacts of capital projects such as the Metro to Blatchford line and the overall growth of our city, do create additional budget pressures. We know that we can't pass the full weight of these expenses to Edmontonians. We're, we are protecting our public services by continuously evaluating what we do and how we operate in the context of effectiveness, efficiency, and relevance to Edmontonians. But as we seek to do the same work when our dollar continues to be stretched, we must support a growing population as well. Compared to other major Canadian cities, Edmonton remains an affordable place to receive a world-class education, start and scale a business and build a community while remaining connected to our diverse cultures and our natural environment. We set an ambitious goal to be a city of 2 million people by 2050 and our migration data shows that our growth has accelerated compared to even what we had forecasted. 
generational work like the zoning bylaw renewal, district planning, and council's direction on OP12 will guide us to scale our services to support 2 million people within our existing geographic boundaries. Through engagement activities, satisfaction surveys, 311 inquiries, correspondence with you and other communications channels, Edmontonia has told us where they want to see their investment. They asked us to deliver core services that enable a good quality of life. We will continue to invest in reliable core service delivery and a small sample of core services includes snow and ice control, which keeps our streets safe during the winter months, traffic and traffic control, which manages congestion and improves road safety, building great neighborhoods, which enhances the quality of life in our communities and fire rescue services, which supports Edmontonians in times of crisis. And we are committed to investing in improving the front door experience for Edmontonians. They asked us to invest in public safety. And this budget adjustment implements the Edmonton Police Service funding formula, which provide, provides predictable funding to support high quality policing services. An arbitrated wage settlement provides wage security to frontline policing officers who we need to attract and retain to support that public safety. They asked us to enhance transit, accessibility and connectivity throughout Edmonton. Over the next three years, the city allocated 1.3 billion to support this priority area. This funding encompasses not only the day-to-day -day operations of bus, LRT and DAT services, but also includes specific measures designed to increase transit safety and security. In addition, the 23 to 26 budget added 3.9 million for capital projects within the public transit sector. They asked us to improve environmental sus sustainability and address impacts of climate change. 376 million will be invested in capital projects that set Edmonton on the right path to embrace different modes of travel, construct and operate buildings in future focused ways and reduce reliance on traditional fuel sources. There is also a portion allocated to cover operational expenses amounting to 90 million. Furthermore, we're allocating an additional 286 million towards capital projects over the full four years that will help us make meaningful strides in combating climate change. Finally, they asked us to ensure that all Edmontons, Edmontonians have a safe place to call home. Our commitment to improving housing in our community remains steadfast. We are allocating 246 million to support housing initiatives with a substantial portion of this four year budget earmarked for capital investment, totaling 115 million. The operating budget is 131 million over 24 to 26. Now an Edmontonian watching this presentation today just wants to know what this budget means for their front door experience and their bottom line. Before I start, I need to clarify that assessment change experience by each property owner each year is unique to that property. This is because the ultimate tax impact to a specific property owner in a given year is dependent not only on the overall change in tax levy, but also on the way their assessment changed relative to others. Based on the budget adjustment we've brought forward today, an average Edmontonian household would pay approximately $750 in property taxes for every $100,000 of their assessed home value in 2024, which is an increase of $49 compared to 2023. This equates to just over $2 per day per 100,000 of assessed value. And for an average home, one assessed in 2023 at $425,500, this is $8.74 per day. So what does that $8.74 per day provide? We believe it facilitates multimodal transit or at travel with active transportation, traffic lights, snow removal, repair crews and transit. It supports healthy living and community connection with parks, recreation facilities, libraries, winter skating, and social programs. It delivers emergency services provided by fire rescue and Edmonton police services. It enhances life in an urban center through arts and culture, tourism, attraction, sports, and it enables opportunities for prosperity through supports for small business and partnerships with educational institutions. Now this slide shows the path from now until November 29th and today the team will walk you through three topic specific presentations and support the first round of questions for, for each item and we will go in the order of operating capital and then carbon. We will return 
to uh, council on the 21st to support council as you review our recommendations, bring forward adjustments and deliberate any changes. And in January and February, we will implement your decisions and we will bring to you the next steps on the operating budget um, adjustment 12, which continues to be in process. These reports will provide analysis on options that you could consider to further shift tax dollars into transit, housing, environmental sustainability, and core services as per the direction we've got on OP12. So thank you for the opportunity to provide this context and now I'll turn it over to financial and corporate services team. Next slide, please. Over the last 30 years, the city has grown significantly. More than 12,000 hectares of land have been urbanized in recent decades, giving us a different footprint. Our population has grown from around 700,000 in 2002 to almost 1.1 million in 2022, which puts growth over the last 20 years at almost 56%. As you'll see in a few slides, the city is still growing. And with this growth comes corresponding increases in services such as fire halls, roads and recreation centers. Edmontons not only expect these services from their city, but the expectation of standards for service levels continues regardless of the economic climate. Next slide, please. The city has limited resource, the city has limited revenue sources. Really, there are only two categories, property tax and non-tax sources such as user fees. The economic climate over the past number of years has been challenging, and as you see on this slide, tax revenue as a percentage of total operating revenues has grown, meaning there's been a heavier reliance on property tax in the last decade. Before we get to the economic update, I want to spend a moment on some important data and insights regarding the economic and social landscape in the Edmonton area. These statistics shed light on the various aspects of the community's well-being. As reported by the Social Planning Council, in 2021, approximately 13.7% of the population in the Edmonton Census metropolitan area was living in poverty. We continue to see an increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton. Data from Homeward Trust as of November indicated that there were over 3,080 people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton. At that level, the count of persons without stable housing has increased for the fourth consecutive year. In 2021, the median family income in the Edmonton Census metropolitan area was $108,390. And for individuals not part of a family, median income was $39,000. Incomes have not been rising as fast as consumer prices. Even though we do not have income data for 2022, it is unlikely that income growth was within the range of consumer inflation, which averaged 6.3% averaged that year. More Albertans are finding it difficult or very difficult for their households to meet financial needs in terms of transportation, housing, food, clothing, and other necessary expenses. Statistics Canada released a few new find, sorry, Statistics Canada released new findings last Friday estimating that one in three households in the Edmonton metropolitan area were likely to report difficulty meeting their financial needs in October. I'll now pass it over to Felicia Muthierdi who will take you through the economic update. Thank you Stacy. Good morning. This economic update will focus on the components of population growth and developments in the value of building permits issued by the city. So Edmonton's population is growing, which increases the demand for city services. This pressure is felt more acutely when growth is much stronger than anticipated, which is what happened between 2021 and 2022, and very likely between 2022 and 2023 based on national and provincial population data. So population estimates are as of July 1st each year. So as charted here is a 12 month change in Ed Edmonton's estimated population over July 1st to June 30th each period. There are two components charted. First, we have net migration, which includes net, net gains of persons from destinations outside, of, or sorry, uh, originating from destinations outside of city limits and natural increase, which is births minus deaths. It's worth noting that we only have detailed population estimates for Edmonton going as far back as the 2016-2017 period. So between 2016 and 2022, Edmonton's population gained more than 123,000 persons, largely through migration. The vast majority of migration to Edmonton has been from outside of the province, which would also include international migration. 
Now, over that six-year period, growth between 2021 and 2022 accounted for almost a quarter of that net increase. So this has translated into increased demand for housing and the consumption of goods and services as what is typically expected from a growing population, especially through migration. However, this also coincided with a period where consumer inflation was high. And as Stacey mentioned, it averaged 6.3% in 2022, and that was its highest annual average since the early 80s. Next slide, please. So here we have the value of building permits issued in Edmonton, which covers a range of construction activity, like the construction of new structures, demolitions, and renovations. Building permit values are split between residential, which includes construction intentions for new single and semi-detached row and apartment units, and non-residential, which includes commercial, industrial, and institutional building permits. In the fall operating budget adjustment report, it was noted that residential construction activity has been slow to respond to how much stronger migration is anticipated to translate into housing demand. Now, new construction can help with creating capacity, but construction activity is typically influenced by market forces and conditions, including available capacity, like what already exists, in what market, and the types of units that are already under construction. Residential construction, which typically accounts for a large share of building construction activity, has been slower in 2023 compared to 2022. It's evident based on this chart that construction intentions through building permit values over the first three quarters of the year have been lower than the same period in 2022. Housing starts have also softened in 2023 so far compared to 2022, though housing starts in Edmonton consistently rose annually in 2019 through to 2022, and there also remains elevated levels of new home inventory for certain dwelling types. There has also been a shift in the composition of units being built with a far greater share of apartments being constructed for the rental market. So this is being brought forward because of the impact this has on the city's economic forecast for assessment growth revenue and how growth revenues anticipate to be weaker for the 2024 taxation year. The value of residential building permits has accounted for anywhere between 57 to 67 percent of building permit values over the past six years. In 2022, that share was the 67 percent. However, interest rates are high, as are building construction costs, which are likely having an impact on what home buyers are able to purchase and likely what builders are interested in constructing. In our current environment with stronger than anticipated population growth from migration, if it persists, we can anticipate opportunities for new construction to pick up in future. However, there is no guarantee how these units will be priced, especially given how much, given much higher costs of construction that we're observing currently. I'll now turn things over to Stacey Padbury to begin walking you through the operating budget adjustment. In alignment with the city's multi-year budgeting policy, the ability to amend the budget is generally limited to the following circumstances. External factors such as provincial or federal budgets or legislative changes, adjustments for operating impacts of capital, unforeseen changes in economic forecasts, and council-directed changes. In December 2022, City Council passed a budget that incorporated a 4.96% tax increase for the year 2024. Achieving this budget figure was a complex process that involved a thorough examination of all aspects of our financial plan. To fully understand this 4.96% increase, we need to disaggregate the various factors that had contributed to it. This includes increases in personnel budgets, including in-range salary adjustments, and the estimated increase in salaries resulting from collective bargaining settlements. Increases in fuel and utilities required to sustain operations for many programs, including fire services, transit, and road maintenance. Increases in debt servicing resulting from adjust adjustments to previously approved capital projects and new projects funded with debt in the 2023 to 2026 cycle. And increases resulting from the Edmonton Police funding formula that was approved in the 2023 year. This fall supplementary budget adjustment includes necessary adjustments to both revenues and expenses in order to address financial pressures. Pressures that contributed to the fall budget adjustments you're seeing today include lower ATCO franchise fee revenue, rising utility costs, adjustments to the police funding formula and the arbitrated settlement for the Edmonton Police Association, operating impacts of capital related to the Metro line, and lower transit revenue. These pressures are offset by a number of items, including higher assessment growth, increases in EPCOR franchise fees, and higher revenues from higher attendance at the city's recreation facilities. There are a number of items that ultimately culminate in the 7.09% tax increase for 2024, 
Attachment one provides the detailed items and explains the increase from the currently approved 4.96% to 7.09%. While we're mindful of the economic challenges facing Edmontonians, we may remain committed to the financial well-being of our community and the provision of services that Edmontonians know and rely on. The city collects the amount of property tax or tax levy required to balance the budget after all other revenue sources are considered. Examples of non-tax levy revenues include user fees for services like transit and recreation facilities, franchise fees, licensing fees, and fines. The tax levy requirement is equal to the total municipal expenditures less all other city revenues. There are numerous challenge changes in the expenditures and non-tax levy revenues which impact the overall tax levy requirement. Property taxes allow the city to balance a budget and collect what it needs to operate, no more and no less. The tax levy requirement or property taxes required to balance this budget is what council approves through the operating budget process. For example, in this fall 2023 supplemental operating budget process, the increase in taxation revenue in 2024 compared to 2023 after considering assessment growth is 7.09%. Once the total levy requirement is determined by council, the assessment and taxation branch provides the total taxable assessment base. This number is effectively a sum of a sum total of all taxable property value in the city for that tax class. Reassessments on all properties in Edmonton are performed annually and are released in January for each year of in January of each year for property owners to review. With the total tax levy requirement and total taxable assessment base, a tax rate can be established, which is then applied to individual property owners based on their property assessment. Council ultimately determines the tax levy requirement. The assessment area is responsible for determining the assessment values. This means that while council is responsible for determining how much revenue is collected, the distribution of the tax levy is determined through the assessment process. The assessment change experienced by each property owner each year is unique to that property. And this means that the ultimate tax impact to a specific property owner in a given year is dependent not only on the overall change in the tax levy, but also on the way their assessment changes relative to others. In other words, they're more likely going to experience a tax change that is different than the tax levy char change approved by council. For example, council may approve a 7% tax increase However, one property owner may experience a higher tax impact while another may experience a lower tax impact because of the way their assessments have changed relative to each other and the rest of the tax class. In 2015, the 2% initiative started. This was a program that required administration to find reductions of 2%. In 2015, that tax increase was 5.7%, but embedded in this increase were reductions of 1.24%. And in the years subsequent, the city continued to practice this practice in a variety of different initiatives in an effort to keep tax increases low by finding offsetting reductions. In addition to our growing community, we must contend with persistent, the persistent issue of inflation. The cost of goods and services rises steadily over time, making it increasingly challenging to maintain existing services and infrastructure within the same budget. In budget, when we budget, we often ask business areas to manage inflation with no increase in funding in an attempt to address the impact of inflation and to drive efficient service delivery. It's essential to acknowledge that our city continues to grow. Edmonton is a thriving community with an ever expanding population and this growth brings with it new demands and challenges. If we do this absorption too often for too long, it can result in an erosion of civic services. Looking at 2023 and the proposed 2024 budget, in addition to the $15 million per year that was removed from the budget as part of OP12, there's a further $26 million in unfunded pressures that have emerged due to a combination of our city's growth and the continuous rise in inflation. When looking at this, in addition to past reductions, this has resulted in a total of $345 million budget impact over the last 10 years, 
or 1.9 billion when you consider the absolute value. Just as citizens are experiencing the impact of increasing costs and spending pressures in their daily lives, the city is grappling with similar financial challenges. In this post-pandemic recovery period, departments are currently experiencing approximately $26 million in unfunded pressures. That's equivalent to 1.34% tax levy due to city growth and inflation. If funded, that would have resulted in an 8.43% tax levy increase. However, when we consider tax tolerance, departments were asked to do their best to manage these unfunded pressures without adding additional funding. While not ideal, this internal pressure can create opportunities for efficiencies, and we all look to our business areas to apply a continuous improvement lens to all their work. There is a risk in absorbing cost pressures within the budget, and we know that if we use this approach too long and too often, it actually changes the services that Edmonton residents depend on. We are experiencing ongoing financial pressures that will be addressed through the fall supplementary operating budget adjustment, including the arbitrated settlement with the Edmonton Police Service, reduced revenues from transit fares and franchise fees and rising utility costs. Along with these pressures, we are facing increasing demands on services from a growing city. We are committed to finding a balance between managing property taxes while still offering the services that Edmontonians count on and continuing to move our infrastructure plans forward. In order to maintain programs and services in the operating budget, we're recommending an additional 2.13% in 2024. I'll now turn it over to Jody Graham, who will walk you through the highlights of these adjustments on the next few slides. For 2024 to 2026, all of the recommended adjustments are summarized in Attachment 1 of the Fall 2023 Supplemental Operating Budget Adjustment Report, and this is what will require Council approval. There are some significant adjustments that result in pressures, but it is important to understand that a number of factors are contributing to the net increase of 2.13%. So I will spend the next couple of slides going through the most significant items contributing to the adjustments in the fall SOBA. I, I'll outline some of the notable adjustments starting with the economic forecast adjustments. Changes to economic forecasts include adjustments that affect costs, changes in service, demand volumes and revenue projections. These include $12.1 million increase in expenses for 2024, $5.6 million in 2025 and an additional 2.1 million as a result of higher utility costs, primarily for power. 6.3 million ongoing reductions in franchise fees from ADCO, ADCO Gas based on a revised forecast starting in 2024. $5.1 million reduction in transit revenues, which have been impacted by a combination of recovery rates of transit ridership and changes in travel behavior. This is about half of the transit revenue shortfall, so there is risk of continued budget shortfalls that may necessitate additional tax levy support in the future. Administration will continue to monitor the remaining shortfall and bring forward updates as necessary. These increases on the net requirement are par partially offset by additional revenue of $4.6 million from assessment growth, an ongoing increase of $8.2 million in revenue and $3.4 million in related expenses, expenses for community recreation facilities due to the higher anticipated attendance volume starting in 2024. The additional costs relate to personnel to support increased attendance and programming and additional security costs to ensure safe facilities. The net impact to the tax levy is an annual reduction of $4.8 million. $6.2 million in additional franchise fee revenue from EPCORP for power, water, wastewater, and drainage. An additional ongoing $8 million in revenue from an increase from the EPCOR dividend, which will be discussed later in the presentation. There are several adjustments that, no impact, that have no impact to the tax levy. The most significant one, and the only one mentioned on this slide, is the ongoing adjustments in investment earnings of $26.8 million increase in 2024, $1.9 million decrease in 2025, and a 0.7 million decrease in 2026 as a result of market conditions for an adjusted investment 
earnings total of $75.9 million over 2024 to 26. Of this, net investment earnings of $61.4 million are being redirected to fund projects in the capital budget, consistent with the city's budget strategies to use investment earnings to fund capital projects on a pay-as-you-go basis. Changes in economic forecast resulted in a $3.1 million increase to the net tax levy requirement, or 0.16% in 2024. External factors and changes in legislation allow the city to respond to external factors such as provincial and federal budgets or changes imposed by legislation. The arbitrated settlement of the Edmonton Police Association resulted in ongoing increase to the Edmonton Police Service of $19.7 million starting in 2024. This is partially offset by a reduction in the financial strategies. For the 2023 to 2026 budget approved in December of 2022, funding for the EPS was approved for 2023 only. There is an ongoing increase of 11.8 million in 2024, 11.4 million in 2025, and 3.9 million dollars in 2026 as a result of the City Council approving the revised funding formula on August 23, 2023. This is partially offset by a million dollar reduction in financial strategies for 2024 and 2025 and $3.9 million in 2026 as these funds were held in anticipation of the revised funding formula. The calculations show full funding for the being allocated for 2024 and 2025 with 2026 being reduced to an incremental 3.9 million because of the 30% civic expenditures cap. Subsequent changes in the operating budget will require a recalculation of the funding formula and this recalculation will occur every fall SOBA. External factors and changes to legislation resulting, resulting in additional 32.3 million in tax levy requirement for 2024 or 1.67%. Operating impacts of capital incorporates the operating impacts related to the acquisition of capital assets or implementation and completion of capital projects. An adjustment is included for the Metro to Blatchford alternative scenario, which funds the operation of the new permanent Nate station starting in 2024 and maintenance of the completed Blatchford Gate Station and associated infrastructure, as the opening of the Blatchford Gate Station will be deferred. The ongoing impact of this increase of $2.4 million in 2024 and minor adjustments in 2025 and 2026. $1.4 million increase is expected in expense is required for ETS auxiliary vehicle growth units, which is a specialized auxiliary vehicle required to maintain the LRT system, including signals and overhead power and substations, which are fundamental to the mobility network. This responsibility transitioned to the City of Edmonton from EPCOR subsequent to the 2023 to 2026 budget deliberations. Total adjustments for operating impacts of capital resulted in a $4.5 million increase to the tax levy requirement or 0.23% in 2024. Two funded service packages are included in the proposed budget, both of which have a direct impact on the community and safety well-being pillars. $2.6 million for the anti-racism high-level office to advance the implementation of the anti-racism strategy, respond to the anti-black racism action plan, uh, and coordinated actions with the Indigenous framework. $1 million in 2024 and an additional $0.6 million in 2025 for the anti-racism independent body to provide operational surety for a community-based independent anti-racism body. The body is the community, community's convening point for anti-racism concerns and ideas, education and advocacy, and serves as an accountability partner for the city's anti-racism actions. These packages add $3.6 million to the tax levy requirement or 0.19% in 2024. In addition to the four types of adjustments that were just outlined, the fall SOBA also includes adjustments to financial strategies, which provides flexibility for unknown amounts over the budget cycle. The amount of funding for the financial strategies budget is based on a risk assessment of potential impacts to the city's operating budget and provides a mechanism to manage fluctuations within the operating budget over the four-year cycle. Risks and funding allocations are monitored and adjusted annually to address the ongoing budget pressures. 
funds are released from financial strategies as necessary to mitigate financial impacts. The net impact is a reduction of $2.2 million in 2024, $10.8 million in 2025, and another $4.2 million reduction in 2026. As you can see in this table, the tax increases initially approved by Council in December of 2022 were 4.96% for 2023, 4.96% for 2024, 4.95% for 2025, and 4.39% for 2026. The recommendations in the proposed SOBA result in the adjustments to the tax levy by 2.13% for a total increase of 7.09% in 2024, 0.09% for a total increase of 5.04 in 2025, and 0.14% for a total tax increase of 4.53% in 2026. To return to the tax increase rates back to the December 2022 would require incremental ongoing budget reductions of $41.2 million in 2024, $1.8 million in 2025, and $2.9 million in 2026. The top table reflects unfunded service packages presented in the fall SOBA, including the items Council has asked to come back for consideration during the budget deliberations. Governance of agencies, boards, and commissions is outside of the city manager and administration's authority. Therefore, all service packages for agencies, boards, and commissions is submit, are submitted as unfunded as the funding decisions related to these in, in agencies must be made by council. The total funding of all unfunded service packages in the SOBA is $50.9 million in 2024, which is a subsequent, an equivalent of 2.63% tax increase. The unfunded service packages have been, have been included in attachment two for your reference. Unfunded service packages that result from motions made after September 15th are included as an addendum. The total of these packages is a second table at 6.7 6 million for 2023, which is the equivalent of a 0.35% tax increase. It is important to highlight that these are our all unfunded service packages as of today. However, as committee and non-budget council meetings continue up to the start of budget deliberations or even over the course of budget deliberations, there could be more unfunded service packages brought forward. Those unfunded service packages will be included as addendums to the fall supplemental operating budget adjustment item at the start, at the start of budget deliberations if necessary. In response to a motion from Council, Attachment 3 of the Fall 2023 SOBA report outlines options for a dedicated renewal fund to address the renewal shortfall and provide a consistent and increased level of funding to increase renewal investment from 30.7% to target funding levels. There are four options for dedicated renewal funds as well as various funding scenarios. Based on the level of impact to the renewal program and the balance between limiting tax tolerance with the time required to achieve the target revenue, the preferred option would be the dedicated, or the dedicated universal renewal fund with 0.25% to 1% successive annual tax increases. This option would take 18 years to achieve the funding target and have two years of 0.25% tax increases, three years of 0.5% tax increase, followed by three years of 0.75% before reaching the annual 1% increase until the far funding target is achieved. The dedicated universal renewal fund would be used to fund the renewal investment gap for all City of Edmonton owned assets, not funded by other dedicated funding sources such as the Neighbourhood Renewal Reserve or Fleet Reserve. As such, facilities, bridges, tunnels, trains and tracks the allocation of renewal investment would be determined by administration based on various criteria, including physical condition, risk, operational and maintenance data and input, and service delivery impacts. Dedicated funding will require the approval of a policy and reserve. If Council provides a motion for administration to develop a policy and tax increase to create a new dedicated renewal fund through the successive annual tax increases, a policy would be completed by June of 2024. Tax in levy increases would start in 2025, so the preferred option, there would be no tax levy impact for 2024, 
and 0.25% in both 2025 and 2026. It is important to clarify that if approved, dedicated tax increases are not unique levies, but rather general tax revenue raised for and dedicated to funding a specific program. This dedicated fund is not included in the proposed 7.09% tax increase. Therefore, Council would have to make a motion to include it in the budget if desired. We recommend that Council discuss and make decisions about any dedicated funds prior to deliberating the operating budget as the outcome may impact the overall tax increase. I will now turn it back to Stacy to close out the presentation. So this concludes our presentation and we look forward to working with you through the process to amend the budget and find a balance between addressing our financial, oh sorry, <laughs> I'm one slide ahead, apologies. Administration released the fall SOBA on October 26. On November 1st, EPCOR announced an $8 million increase to the dividend it pays annually to the city. Administration was not aware of this increase during the bu budget development and as such, this provides additional revenue over and above what was contemplated in the budget. We have adjusted attachment one to reflect the EPCOR dividend and we've placed the EPCOR dividend within the financial strategies account. Council can choose to invest it in services without further impacting the tax levy or alternatively, council could choose to reduce the tax levy an impact, if, if used to reduce the tax levy, the reduction would be 0.41%. So now that it concludes our presentation. We look forward to working with you through the process to amend the budget and to find a balance between addressing the financial pressures, our financial pressures, taxpayers' tolerance for increases, and Edmontonians' expectations for services and infrastructure. Thanks for your attention and we will, we are happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much for uh, such a detailed uh, presentation. This is very helpful uh, to understand. Uh, so I uh, really appreciate all the hard work that has gone into uh, by the administration preparing this. Uh, now we will open up uh, questions uh, from council members. Uh, Councillor Nack, you exempted this, so please start. Uh, sure, thanks Mayor Sophie. Thanks for the information. I'll just run, because we only get one round, I'll run through a bunch. Um, just to clarify on the EPCOR piece, you said it's not included, but I, I saw it included in the slides, so I just want to, I was. So no, we've amended attachment one and attachment two yeah. to place the money in the budget. So the revenue is I in the see, budget so that's why, with a I get corresponding it. expenditure in financial strategies, now which gives Sorry, you money to allocate. Sense. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, dedicated renewal fund, even if that was approved, wouldn't affect the 2024. I know you mentioned it's not included, but it, but you had shown zero for 2024, right? That's correct. Even oh. if you approved it today, there would not be an increase in 2024. It would just start to affect in 25. Fantastic. Correct. Yeah. Um, wanted to double check, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Ms. on on the population growth numbers. I, I feel like, I can't remember, it was maybe a, at our last quarterly update, you had talked about the 22 to 23 population growth numbers, and I thought you had said... 40,000 people, or am I making that up in my head? Does, does that sound familiar? You just didn't include it on your chart, so I wanted to double check. Yes, thank you so much for the question. So what was tried at our actual estimates, sorry, our estimates, not actual, estimates from um, that we get for Edmonton in terms of the detailed components of population change. Okay. When we're talking about 2022 to 2023, we'll get those numbers in January 2024. Okay. So that's when we'll be able to provide confirmation, but what we discussed was our forecast rate and what, what that may entail so if we were so That's why you didn't include it on your chart because Correct. right now it's an estimate, but a pretty good estimate is what you're saying. That's what we should be generally expecting based off what you've been seeing. That would be for past for past years. We'll we'll get a closer look into that 2022 okay. 23 change in January. Great, yes. thank you. Uh, for the transit revenue shortfall number, the one thing I was curious about. I, it's been it's been a long year. Uh, so last year during the budget deliberations, I we we had built in an assumption that transit revenue was going to go down. Correct when we when we approved the last the four year budget. And, and so this transit revenue shortfall is on top of that, or did we never actually build that into sort of the base budget and assumption that transit revenue is going to take time to, to get back up? So we, if I remember correctly, we built in, um, we increased transit revenue and we held an amount in financial strategies to offset the potential exposure. Um, okay, but with the reductions of the $15 million, um, that came from OP12 and the combination of the 
of transit not growing, transit revenue is not increasing in the manner that we had expected, we're still $5 million short. Okay, so so what, so sorry, I'm just to make sure I understand. So we had we had built in some some adjustments within financial strategies, um, but as part of OP twelve and the the sort of fifteen million dollar piece, you made you made adjustments, and and that's where we're at now. So the net the net results after those adjustments is is why we're looking at that five million shortfall. Yeah, so when, when ridership started to come back, we released the, the five million that we had set aside in financial strategies to the 15 million because we're trying to find that. Yeah. Subsequent to that decision, then we realized that yes, ridership was back, but the pattern in which they were coming back was different. Okay. And so that is now resulting in a total of about $10 million shortfall of which we have funded half of it okay. and we're gonna continue to monitor. That makes sense, okay, I understand that now. Uh, last question, oh, look at that, holy jeez, rushing through the questions. Um, the utility costs piece, so, so our utility costs are going up, that's not a surprise, that's everywhere. Uh, can you, do you have any explanation on this? So I saw utility costs are going up, we're getting more EPCOR franchise fees, but ATCO going down, and I'm just curious, in a world where utility costs are going up, to, uh, uh, that felt odd when I saw that, but I don't have a, good understanding of the ATCO franchise fee piece and why why that would be going down in the same way the other one's going up. We're all looking to this side. <laughs> so, um, so, so can you, can you help me with the ATCO yeah. franchise fees? Yeah, for sure. So um, uh, yeah, utility costs are going up just due to the, uh, the, yeah. the utility rate increases. The ATCO gas franchise fee increase, so that's the result, they did a cost of service study. And so we, we collect uh, a percentage of the distribution yeah. rate revenues. So it's just the cost distribution has changed there. So we're getting we're getting um, a smaller franchise fee based on their redistribution of costs. Yeah. So they're unrelated um, items. Um, and then the EPCOR, the EPCOR dividend is um, just $8 million increase. Yes, yeah, the EPCOR fee. So, I, so just so I'm making sure I understand, so the idea is that um, even though the overall utility costs are going up because the franchise fees, they're not fixed because as, as you mentioned, they're adjusting, but it's, it's based off the franchise fee has a, has a bit of a basis on, on growth in service. If they're doing more service to new areas, that there's, there's new utility infrastructure and, and that, that then we can recover fees from, is that? And so what's happening is that they, they've made their own internal adjustment. They're maybe not seeing the same growth in, in additional serviced areas and that's part of why we're, unlike EPCOR, which is seeing an increase in the franchise fees, we, we aren't seeing it on the ATCO side. Oh, geez, I'm out of time. No, sorry. Correct, and just, just yeah, so it's yeah. just a redistribution of costs and revenues okay. on the ECO side. Thank you, Constant Ed. Constant Cartwell. Thank you. First of all, I'm a little confused. Are we just doing operating budget questions right now? I'm, okay. And there's more presentations to come? Yeah, all they'll, right. All right. capital, there'll be presentation on carbon budget, so this is to uh, just question on ca operating, sorry. Correct. Okay. Um, okay, then just quick hitters then, what is our operating deficit? We had a report a few months ago that suggested it was 70 some million. This sort of implies it's 42 million-ish. What's our deficit? So we haven't publicly released a deficit number um, other than the 73.8. Our monthly deficit numbers suggest that that's trending downward. If, if, if I was forced to guess right now, I would guess it to be around the 48 to $50 million mark for quarter three, but we're, we haven't compiled those numbers yet. So that effectively is what the FSR, do I have this correct? That's effectively what the FSR is for. If we have a deficit, it comes out of the FSR and then we replenish the FSR. That's correct. And what we do is we look for what, in, what contributed to the deficit that needs to be adjusted to not create structural issues in the budget. Right. And so that's what you see in this budget too. But we have three years, according to the MGA, to repay a deficit. Correct. So, so the, according to the, so I just want to separate the MGA from our policy. Our policy says that if we bring the FSR below its minimum, we have three years to replenish it to the minimum. So the way I'm reading the documents, we're replenishing it back to the minimum all next year. No, we don't actually have anything in this budget that replenishes back to the minimum because we're hoping to drive that number lower. Okay, so I, I would like some, and my guess is that we're going to take these questions, take some things away and provide information for our conversation in two weeks. 
Yes, is that a fair presumption? So I would like to know how we can employ that, pay back the deficit over three years instead of pay it all back next year and save some dollars on the tax requisition. So I just want to be really clear. And if that means Nothing in the 7.9% involves paying back the deficit to its involves a payback of the deficit or a replenishment of the FSR to its minimum balance. So I think this is fun with numbers. We did not take in as much money in 2023 as we spent. Therefore, we have a deficit. And we have three years to make that up. And if we take three years instead of one year, we can save dollars on the tax increase for next year. So we have a deficit last year. We don't need to repay anything because we're taking it from the financial stabilization reserve. And maybe we have three years to replenish it to its minimum. We've included none of that in this budget. So there's something else is going on then. And I want clarity on that. Because it's not clear how these dollars are flowing. It's not clear to me how we can spend more than we take, which is fair. Things happen. But that is, by definition, an operating deficit. And by definition, the financial stabilization reserve is unallocated previous savings of the corporation that is used to offset a deficit when it happens in the year. So let's flow that in over more years and not do it all next year. There's something to be saved there. I don't think that's in alignment with your policy. I know. But we're in exceptional years, and that means exceptions to policies. So the only other, so we can take this away and look at it. But if we, like, I think what you're asking for is a smoothing strategy: smooth this out for longer. Uh, yeah, fair. Um, so we can take back and look at bringing you a smoothing strategy to spread what is seven, five, four and a half to something like six and a half, six and a half, four, or make it even. Um, but it would be a smoothing strategy um, rather than a FSR, then repaying the deficit over there. Like it would be a combination of those two things. I would like a clear picture to share with those I represent that says this is how, this is how we get to spending more than we take and these are the implications on our various budgets and how that flows through and why we're why we you know why we do it at the pace that we do it okay so right now i don't have anything in the budget for the replenishment to the minimum so i would bring a smoothing strategy including replenishing back to the minimum okay my time's up thank you Councillor cardinal Councillor right thank you very much um okay so i'm i'm thinking about the operating impacts of capital and I know there was like a number of and I don't know if I should be asking this in capital or here but um, I know there was a number of uh, fleet purchases and things like that um, in the 2023-2026 budget um, have that has that been looked at to maybe defer some of those purchases to reduce the impact on our operating once council approves the capital budget the we we automatically start to implement what was approved by council and so we wouldn't necessarily look to defer any of the decisions of council as it relates to the capital budget unless directed to do so okay so we would have to but i but i'm also wondering have have we been able to make those purchases of fleet vehicle fleet vehicles i think i'd maybe defer to mr robar for that question yeah we've we've definitely had challenges in purchasing vehicles and and have defer, like deferred some to other years. The We've looked at the budget and have already made deferral decisions on, on fleet vehicles, so further deference of, of, of vehicles would have a negative impact on our fleet. Okay. And, and maybe deferral is a question of capital, right? If, okay. you're gonna, if you're gonna buy something and you'd like to buy it in a later year, um, that doesn't save you any money necessarily. What saves you money is not buying it at all. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, also, okay, the decrease in taser revenues. Um, I'm just wondering, has any effort or attempt been made um, 
to work with the province on um, having them rescind their moratorium and an automatic tra automated traffic enforcement guideline. Just to clarify, the um, the five million dollars in twenty twenty five that you're noticing there, <clears throat> that's not um, adding money to the tax levy. That is putting money back in. So that is a, a reversal of, uh, of of money back into the tax levy to alleviate tax pressure. But I mean, just, but like over the past couple of years, that revenue has has decreased. Overall. Correct. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so it's I mean, a that, revision, a revision of an estimate. We expected that revenue would decrease, but it's actually decreased less than we expected. And so you're seeing five million come back into the estimates. Yeah, but there, there's still that big chunk that's been lost over the past few years. And I, I, so I'm just wondering, has there been any? We are any? in ongoing discussions with the province around uh, elevating that conversation around uh, our ability to grow uh, locations and what that looks like for the city. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted to know there. Um, and then with the um, the EPA settlement, um, I thought I asked this the last time we got a bargaining update, and I know it's private, so I'm just going to ask, could I please get copies of what the mandates were? Because um, it looks like there was about four, four or five uh, bargaining, collective bargaining updates that were provided in 2021. Um, so I'm wondering if I can get the, what those mandates were that were provided uh, or that were approved by council in 2021. We can do that. Yeah. For you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I will, oh, just one other quick question. Will our revenues decrease, uh, due to less rezoning, rezoning applications coming through? That's not anticipated, but we've adjusted our fees um, to ensure that the planning and development business model is cost recovery. Okay, perfect. Great. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for the presentation. Um, just want to pick up on, on the question that Councillor Cartmel was asking. So in attachment two, it looks like the FSR is returning to, to its minimum balance in 2024. So I'm just wondering, where where are or where is the funding originating from to replenish it? Maybe I'm missing something. We're just checking to see if we uh, to see where you're talking about. If you can give me the page number. Oh sure. Um, and I mean, I can take this one offline, but I guess I, I have similar questions just around what is our approach to um, to replenishing it back to the to the minimum. It looks it, to me, it looks like that's all happening 2024, but maybe I'm interpreting that incorrectly. So I can I can take that offline, and we can we can have a, a chat about that. But um, okay, yeah, or we can get you an answer a little yeah, bit yeah, later yeah. today. Yeah, 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 that'd be excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and then I also had questions just about uh, our current approach to increasing fees for, for things like permitting lic and licensing. Um, it sounds like, you know, minor adjustments are being made, uh, as, as Ms. Petrin just mentioned. Um, it looks like a couple of the fees are being increased very gradually by about 2% in some realms. Others are not being touched at all. Uh, I guess I'm just looking for a little bit of rationale for, for how we toggle um, our fees and licensing. Just broad approach to that. For the fees related to the planning and development business model, so applications, business licenses, um, the fees have been increased by inflation. Across the board? Um, I'd have to double check, but uh, we had to adjust our fees because of the new zoning bylaws, so there are adjustments in rezoning fees that are not necessarily relevant to inflation. Okay, okay, and maybe... Like beyond that, I have questions about like every fee under fire services, for example, is, is held at 0% uh, for all four years. I'm just wondering, like, was there thought given to playing with those numbers a little bit? I don't know who so to are direct you, that to. <laughs> are you, I guess, are like, you I'm, I'm wanting us to bring back 
as part of the budget uh, uh, to the deliberations what fee increases for fire rescue services could potentially look at. Yeah, I mean, like. even, I think what would be valuable for me is even just a memo or bring it back to budget, um, kind of the, the most frequent user fees and permit uh, licensing opportunities, if you will, uh, that are not related to core services, public facing, like I'm not talking transit or rec centers or domestic tourism like like Matard or, or John Jansen, um, but I do have questions about like property assessment detail reports, um, fire rescue services fees, just wanna know which ones have that high potential to, uh, with a very small change, potentially have a, a significant um, increase on the revenue side. Yeah, okay. Councillor, we can put something together for you. Perfect, great, thank you so much. Um, one of the things I was uh, maybe expecting to see but didn't, uh, was there supposed to be an infill compliance package to increase the number of enforcement officers? Did I miss that as an unfunded package? We can, we can double check. I would okay. say that where we had, we publish the service packages that are read, that are available okay, at the date and we'll continue to add anything that comes available. Sounds good. Uh, and then one last question. I just wanted to make sure my understanding is correct. Um, so there was a slide around unfunded growth and inflationary pressures, uh, essentially suggesting that um, departments have, have already gone through a bit of an exercise internally, it sounds like, um, to, to reduce from, what was it? Was it a 1.2% tax levy, internal cost pressures? One point, the equivalent of 1.34. Okay, and that's outside of other exercises like OP12, that is above and beyond. Yeah, I would say that we do that. We ask areas to not adjust for inflation and try to find it through efficiencies. It doesn't necessarily get captured as savings because it's more, I would consider it more cost avoidance. Right, so that's a reduction, essentially. It's an increase not taken, I would describe sure. it as. Sure, um, okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much, I'm out of time. Thank you, Council Salvador, Costa Jans. Thank you so much for this. Um, just a question, how much is the operating budget again? 3.3 .3 billion? Yeah, approximately. 3.3 .3 billion, so, um, and last, and kind of building off Council Cart's Mel's question, we were in a, a surplus of $82 million last year, is that right? Uh, not for 2023, but for 2022. Okay, and then now we're um, uh, potentially in a deficit of 50? So it 73 sounds like- 73.8 uh, publicly, but trending towards 50-ish. Ish. Yeah, so it sounds like on a $3.3 .3 billion budget, we fluctuate somewhere within the range of $100 million per year. Is that about right? Yeah, I think I think we fluctuate in the order of around one percent of the budget. Okay. Um, but for the most part, it's actually it's quite rare for us to run a deficit. Okay. And and if had we not voted on the police funding formula, or if if had had been remained static, and had we remained uh, not done the salary settlements that had been static, the tax increase proposed here today would have been point zero five. Is that correct? Not seven, or not two, two, an additional two. It'd be 5.5, .5, right? As I read it, of the 2.13, 1.62 is going to the police. So the remainder going to the city corporate is only 0 0.05. Is that right? So not quite, because what I would say is you see two things in this budget. You see us increase police funding for the difference between what we were holding in settlements and what was arbitrated. By how much? I'm not going to, well. Oh, sorry, okay, fine, fine, keep going. Um, so I, do, I don't wanna, I don't wanna disclose the previous mandate because the other oh, collective yeah, funding agreements are yeah. still under. Um, and you see us increase, um, increase for changes in the funding formula, but some of those things, some of those estimates were in last year. So that 1.63% is the total impact when we take what was in our corporation plus net new and we allocate it to police. So it, you but would look I at that 1.63% yeah. as the percentage, like it is 1.63 of 7.09. And if you tried to split it into its, what was in 4.96 and what was in the 2.13, you would split it in half roughly. But if I'm trying to tell my constituents that we hear you, safety is an issue, 
we are investing in policing and we spent 22.3 million dollars of the tax increase that's that's over a buck and a half to go towards backfilling the photo radar hole and then another 15.2 going towards uh, 15.2 million dollars going towards healthy streets in Chinatown another million for the TRC day salary settlements funding formula on and on I, I mean we're talking of the 7% tax increase I think we're close to 4% of that is going to the police Councillor Jens the clarifying questions only uh, uh, can you clarify is that does that add up is well, that 4% so the two, remember I, the 22.3 was adjusted in 2023, not 2024. Okay. So, so it's not actually part of the 2024 numbers. Are we making an investment in public services? I believe that we are. Um, you've, you have absolutely increased the police budget um, and you see that as 1.63 as part of the 7.09. So I do believe that we're investing in those public services. Um, I don't know that, and but health, like some of these things were approved. Some of what you're describing was actually approved in 2023 as a base adjustment, so it doesn't come in again in 2024. And some of it is only a portion, like healthy streets operation. There's a portion of it that was in 2024. Because I, I liked your presentation in that. I could go and say, we're investing in rec centers. We're investing in transit. We're even investing in anti-racism. We're investing in, like, like these things are delineated and lined out. But when, you know, and, and yes, I've been critical of the police spending, but the real, like when I'm trying to s tell people we are investing in policing, it's, it's not, I, I'm, I'm struggling how to communicate that. Like I can point to their budget was tax base at three, 357 when we started. Now it's going to be like 350, 450, I think. Like, like I could point to the Delta in just cash, but, um, uh, uh, I guess you, like the, also those numbers that you're providing are the net operating requirement, not the expenditure budget for police. But I, I mean, I think it's a fair statement. Yeah. We have invest, we have absolutely invested as police, and you see that as part of this budget. I'm not, I'm not sure what more you want us to to say about that. It counts. Yeah, I, I guess I would say that that was the whole intent of the slide that I briefed at the front end on public services and long range investments, where we outlined specifically in those five categories, the core services that enable good quality of life, public safety, which we, out, uh, we ha highlighted all the police numbers, transit accessibility and connectivity through Edmonton, fourth was affordable housing, and then fifth was action to improve environmental sustainability, which, you know, which is consistent direction we've gotten from council yeah. over the last two years in terms of investing in those things. So yeah. that's where we tried to articulate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you very much. Um, just want to say a huge thank you for the social context slide. Really appreciate that being included and look forward to continuing to evolve that as part of our, our overall economic update. Um, I'm going to return to a question uh, earlier because I was also confused and I'm not sure I got, got further clarity. So again, uh, you know, the slide, in terms of the EPCOR dividend, the slide shows a negative impact to the tax levy, so a 0.41% reduction. So, so, it be new so that is okay. You, so what we did in this attachment one in attachment two is what we've previously called cashing the check. We accept the money, it goes into revenue, and we put the offset into financial strategies. That means there's eight million dollars in financial strategies that hasn't been allocated to a service. You can choose to allocate that to a service, or you can reduce the tax levy because it's unallocated. If you reduce the tax levy, it's 0.41. Okay, but but the math that adds up to the seven point zero, that adds up to the tax increase, seems to include the negative point four one percent from the upcor dividend, and the the positive point four one percent is in financial strategies. So it's in the line. There's only a single line for financial strategies. It's in with other adjustments to financial strategies. Okay, okay. Um, I just want to go back to the uh, traffic safety and automated enforcement reserve. So there's an ongoing decrease in expenses of five million. Can we go through that again? So that that is five million. That is just we're not having to commit that from the tax levy. And has that been allocated? It is an ongoing increase in revenue from automated enforcement okay. um, as opposed to uh, expenses. And it has been allocated. It is incorporated in the 7.09. So it has been allocated to service to balance to the 7.09. Okay. And the policy around uh, the traffic safety and automated enforcement reserve, 
what, what is included in that? What do we fund out of that reserve? What can we fund out of that reserve? Uh, if I remember back to the policy correctly, you can fund um, Office of Traffic Safety. Pre previously, we had funded uh, safety components of Edmonton Police Service, um, and you can fund com community facility enhancement projects. And I'm just double checking, I think, so you see that money get transferred in the reserve, so the, it, it transfers to the reserve that it's kind of considered an expense, but it might be allocatable. So let me just double check. Okay, thank you. Um, for the unfunded service package around traffic enforcement, there seems to be a $1 million one-time cost. Uh, I was wondering if we had any clarity on that, if that is a capital expenditure or... I'm not sure who we're waiting for. I'm just looking it up. Oh, I, do, I just okay. don't happen Sorry. to know that off the top of my head. Okay, okay, we can follow up on that. Um, on October 24th, we had a report on uh, that was related to the bylaw that will introduce the um, increased property tax on derelict properties. And the report anticipated that there would be about a $965,000 annual increase in tax revenue for that. Just wondering if that was reflected in the in the forecast for next year or if that's a funding source that we could use uh, potentially for the, the problem properties pilot. I believe it's captured in the overall tax revenue number. So it would already be accounted for. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, just on attachment to page 21, so I noticed that too, there was the redeploying of the Valley Line Southeast hours and buses and the satellite gar garage facility. And I saw that neither of those were indicated as a council priority. Um, you know, and I, I had felt that transit was sort of squarely in our priority list. So just wondering what the analysis was there. So when we looked at whether or not it was council priority and how it worked is we looked at whether or not the increase in service would be. So for example, if we're, we're legally required, we're assuming that the base level of funding is meeting that legal requirement. So while transit itself is, we didn't necessarily know for sure that that particular service package would be a, a council priority. So it's, it's a little bit of a nuance. Like, yes, we know that transit is absolutely a council priority, but is that particular change in transit a council priority? Okay. It's hard to say for sure. And just based on enhancing encampment response, are they mutually exclusive or one has to build on the other? The core one is kind of the base, and if you want enhanced, then you would take it to the next. And we can't do one. enhanced without the core? I don't believe so. Okay. No, just wanted no. to clarify. Thank you. All my time. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Okay, I have some questions. Um, just kind of jumping off of Councillor Jans. So the 1.63%, does that include the funding that was taken out of financial strategies? for the offset, so it's actually technically higher than that, wouldn't it be? No, it would be, so it's about, about half is what came out of financial strategies. So, so that's that reduced, the full that, amount. that reduced the ta tax levy because you took it out of financial strategies. So the 1.63 is the total transfer, because remember we're doing okay. two things. Okay. We're adjusting estimates and it wasn't, some of it was in your budget, but it was in the budget for corporate programs. Now, the 1.63 is what's going over to police overall. Okay, perfect, that helps clarify. And then we had a, a conversation and council directed administration to phase out the non-residential tax subclass in February 2023. Um, and it, other residential would decrease by 11.7% and residential would increase by 1.6%. And that was supposed to be phased in but I'm not seeing that anywhere in terms of that tax impact. Like where do we, where do we talk about that within this context? So you, you wouldn't see that because that's a district, so you're responsible for in determining what the total tax revenue is. You would see that impact once we determine the, the assessment and, the, and what goes to which yeah. subclass. So it's part of the allocation of a set once we allocate out so what, what you approved as an increase. For, what is the phase in for 20? Because for, for me it's important when I'm thinking about context and I'm thinking about the the seniors that are on fixed income in my ward that it's not just 7%. So I'm just trying to get a sense of of 
what is the phase in of that for this year? I would have to just double check that number. I don't could, have it at my fingertips. If you could double check that yeah. for me, that would be great. Um, and then, I guess to to Ms. Petrin, did we already did we or I guess back to you first? Did we phase that out in the so soba, the spring soba last year? Did we do our first phase out, or did it start in 2024? Of the other residential, yeah. It starts, I believe, in 2024. in 2024, yeah. Okay. So I guess to Ms. Petrin, we're seeing, you know, according to the economic forecast, we're not seeing this number of home build starts. I, I guess, are you going to be tracking in 2024 and beyond the starts that are purpose-built rentals versus uh, ownership as a, as a tracking mechanism? We do not track purpose-built rentals, but I'm just going to check. It's okay. Um, it's okay. I just, okay. we can take that offline. And then I guess my other question is just around the, the numbers. So just to confirm, over the three years, if I do my math correctly for the police, it's, it's a, like essentially 11 million and change in 2024, but times three, and then 11.4 million times two, and then the last amount times one, right? So it's, it, it works out to about the total envelope over the next three years in operating is 63 million. Okay, so we're thinking yes, but I'm, I okay. also struggle answering like- I just feel just like we've had, lot of we've had a lot of, of back and forth conversations on the, the one time or, or cumulative, even with OP12 conversations. So I just wanna make sure I understand that. And then I guess the one thing that I thought was interesting is it talks about in the report that the nine million that's transferred from the province for the 50 police officers, um, that has no tax levy impact. But I guess my question is, does it have other cost impacts to the city that we are incurring? I think about some of the other things like the Shigella outbreak where we've absorbed some of the cost on behalf. I just wanna make sure that that nine million is full full coverage, and if we don't have the answer today, that that answer is available by com police commission or somebody else uh, for the debate uh, on the twenty first. So I'm not sure I understand the link to Shigella, but the nine million dollars is oh, for fully example. funded fifty but, police officers, and we're negotiating it, with the province to also get the capital perfect. and the equipment associated that's, that's, with that. Because that's that was gonna, what I was going to ask, but that so the. Because it breaks down to about 180 million or 180,000 per officer, so it covers like their benefits, their all all the things, right? There's not anything we're incurring. Yeah, I think we have to double check on that, Councillor. But okay. I think you're, if I, I just want to confirm, I, I think the intent here is that, like with the other, um, you know, be, previously we got we were given 100,000 per officer, and of course there that had not kept up. So we will make sure okay. that we get. A clear understanding of the. I believe it is all in, but we'll make sure we come back and, and are able to clarify that. that. On that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. And Jody just ran your numbers so it's, she can confirm. Okay. The, the absolute value is sixty-two point one million. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor the first Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you very much for um, this very comprehensive um, presentation and all the reports. Um, I guess I uh, I want to better understand. Um, first, the transit fare revenue, um, you know, just thinking about with the new LRT that's now open, last December when we did the four-year budget, we didn't know when it's going to open to factor the cost and revenue of that in, right? So when, when we built in, out the revenue, they look at it as based on new riders coming on. So they would have already taken into consideration what they thought the number of new riders. When you open up the LRT, it can just shift riders from one, one form to another. And so the, the four-year revenue increases already took that into consideration. But not necessarily the new riders that might come with the LRT being open. Yeah, we do take into account a small increase for new ridership. Obviously, the the Valley Line is a um, a uh, supplementary service to what's there now, and on the uh, the precursor service that we have for the Valley Line. So that ridership is mostly transitional, with a small increase that was baked into the budget. Okay, um, 
I guess, yeah, I, I was a bit surprised to read that because with the line open, um, I, th I thought the assumptions that it would, you know, the assumptions will, will increase ridership and, and revenue. And then the other thing I'm curious because with the RT now open, um, that cost of what is, I forget the word, is it the royalty per month um, of operating uh, by Transed? Like that's also kind of factored in. Or I guess I'm just wondering how that significantly impacted this portion of the operating budget. So that had always been factored in okay. um, and goes to the reserve. And so we've been incurring savings in the previous years, but the base funding's there. Okay, because I, I mean, I guess, you know, for a while we just didn't know when that's gonna kick in, right? Until very recently. That's um, oh, go ahead. That was correct, sorry. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, and then I guess back to the police funding formula, I'm, I'm wondering if you can give me, um, I'm interested in that police budget to civics department ratio for 2024, 2025, 2026. Um, and I'm looking at page seven and eight of attachment two. And when you calculate that ratio, are you using, for example, the, the 537 million for police service in 2024 versus the total civic department, so 1.7 six five billion on page eight is that are is that the calculation that you use for the ratio yeah we use the 1.765 uh -huh. for the for the uh, civic expenditures in comparison to eps expenditures the, so the, the 537 million correct so doesn't that ratio exceed 30 percent in 2024 then don't believe so. They got their full amount of funding in 2024 and 2025, but they do get a reduced amount in 2026. Right. I guess in 2024, that ratio, because I just calculated, it's over 30%. So I would have expected the reduction to come earlier in 2025 versus 2026, that's all. And I was a little perplexed about the calculation of that. Let us just double check where our calculations are showing that it is, I mean, it's close to the limit, but sorry, I just have to find my sheet. Our and then I'm assuming that 537 million is expenditure plus settlement plus the funding formula increase. Yeah, so for 2024, we're showing 29.8, so, so very mm -hmm. close. Okay, and so then, then that means the next year is push it over to that 30, over 30%. And that's why the 2026 decreases to 3.8. That's correct. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I probably may have some questions offline, but um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Principe, can you take the chair, sure, please? Sure, I'll take the chair. Thank you. I want to start with the 2024-2026 proposed adjustment slide that talks about changes to economic forecast uh, and the things that are listed, uh, number of them. So these are the things that we would not have anticipated when we gave approval to 4.96%, right? That's correct. Okay. So if I go down... Uh, to the next slide, I look at external factors, changes to legislation. Under there, you highlight EPS arbitration salary, EPS funding formula. But those two were not, uh, like, the council voted on both of them. Like, council approved the arbitrated salary settlement, right? But it was after we got no, the After, client. but no. Yeah, after. Like, that so, shouldn't be a surprise to council. So we did have some funding put aside for the arbitrated settlement, yeah. and we had some funding put aside for the funding formula, yeah. but we needed to adjust yeah. and, and add some more because yeah. we didn't have enough put aside for each one of those. Absolutely, but when we approved that settlement, we knew there will be additional cost. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay, so that shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, EPS funding formula, again, council voted on it, right? And we knew what the cost is going to be. 
That's correct, and oh. there, there were some adjust adjustments based on the formula and adjusting population, but for the most part. Yeah, so those are not surprising factors. I just, I know why are they considered external factors? These are console driven changes, console approved changes, sorry. Why are they considered external factors? So I think we consider the arbitrated settlement to be an external factor because someone external to the city made the yeah, decision. external to administration, but council voted on it, so it becomes council has to own it. So we can place that in the category of council directed, if if you prefer. I think from an accountability point of view, I think we need to start owning the decisions that we make, right? So. Uh, uh, I would, I, it's up to you, I don't want to direct you how you do your presentation, but I think it's, uh, from a accountability point of view, I think it is important that we start owning the decision that we, we make, right? So, uh, uh, okay, I want to get back to the uh, slide that Andre, you presented. I think that's a very good slide where you're balancing the budget rising costs. What I want to understand, and this goes back to Constable Jans's question, which is, I think, I don't want to focus on 3.12. I want to focus on 7.09. And I want to understand what that 7.09 buys us, right? How much is going toward maintaining existing services? How much is going toward transit? How much is going toward snow and ice? How much is going toward police? and how much is going to our debt servicing, which is uh, paying for capital or housing. I think that gives a good picture, because we cannot, like when we vote on the final budget, we will be voting on 7.09%, right? And whatever is approved, right? We're not gonna say, or we gonna re-vote again on 4.96% mingled into whatever additional increase might be. Yeah, there'll be, I think, one vote. What is that global, what does that global number yeah. be, right? Five, right. six percent, seven percent, five, whatever that. Right? I think what, I understand the whole package. Yeah. What that buys us, because then gives a true picture instead of, I don't want to pick 2.13 and say majority money is going towards police. I want to understand the whole picture of uh, the entire increase. Yeah, and I think to understand the whole picture, you got to also count what's in the base. Yes. And then what's we're adding with the 7.9. So we can, we can, um, if possible, maybe work I on a think that way of expressing And also, that. is it also possible to, because I'm going through some of the list, right? There are, I feel there are certain areas in the city that, we are subsidizing uh, external agencies through tax levy, such as developers. I want to understand better if there's a way to, can you share some information that will allow to adjust some levies, right? Or also, uh, is there a way to, uh, maybe there's a process for us to raise questions and ask for more information to better prepare for budget? Yeah, so I just want to be clear what, what you're, uh, I think you're asking, are there other opportunities in in um, in UPE specifically, I think, for yeah. the services we provide for development? Is that? I want to see, like, we should not be subsidizing external partners or agencies that are, or developers. And I noticed that we, there's, there's subsidy to that. So I want to understand opportunities for adjusting fees and, uh, and other revenues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm out of time. Uh, Okay, I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Uh, that concludes all the questions. And yeah, thank you so much. Now we'll go next to our second presentation, which is on the capital, right? Go ahead, please. So moving on to the supplemental capital budget adjustment known as the SCBA for the 2023 to 2026 capital budget. The SCBA allows Council to adjust the capital budget twice a year in response to the changing project needs, new funding opportunities and challenges, emerging issues and changing priorities. Periodic adjustments also allow the City to make changes to capital project budgets as required using the project development and delivery model known as PDDM. The PDDM model is iterative. At each stage of concept and design, more, pri more precise estimates are possible. This allows the city to ensure projects move to an appropriate level of development before being considered for delivery. Regular budget adjustments are part of this model. The corporate business plan outlines the actions we will take to achieve Connect Edmonton strategic goals and the city's big city moves 
We are focused on maintaining a great city, including parks, bridges, paths, roads, buildings, and LRT lines Edmontonians use every day. The capital budget responds to these challenges by focusing on maintaining the infrastructure we have and advancing projects that are critical to the city's growth. The projects in the capital budget build our, our Edmonton's mobility network, no matter how people choose to move around. The projects support development of communities where people can meet many of their needs within 15 minute commute and the investment and the capital investments support economic growth across our city's ma many industries and capital projects help us to adapt to climate change and support energy transition. Next slide. The current four year capital budget was approved in December of 2022 and adjusted through the spring SCBA in June of 2023. Today we are presenting the second supplemental capital budget adjustment for this cycle with adjustments for the period of 2023 to 2026. The fall 2023 capital budget adjustment report has three recommendations. The first is that the 50 adjustments in attachment six of the fall 2023 SCBA report be approved. They are comprised of six different types of adjustments as you can see on the slide. The next slides will be providing additional information on each of these categories and highlighting the significant adjustments within them. The second recommendation is that the in private discussion outlined in attachment 10 of the fall SCBA report also be approved. And the third recommendation is that attachment 11 of the fall 2023 SCBA report is for council to be approved with an exception of the profile active transportation implementation acceleration approach three. This would allow projects over $2 million to remain within the existing profile. There would be efficiencies to delivering these projects within their existing composite profile, such as timely project tendering, flexibility around project location grouping and delivery models, and reduce administration work for the SCBA adjustments and borrowing bylaw amendments. Next slide. This slide shows the approved capital budget, including the 2023 spring SCBA. The slide includes tax supported operations, the waste utility and the Blatchford Downtown District Energy Utilities. The approved capital budget for the entire city prior to the 2023 fall SCBA is $10.29 billion comprised of $9.23 billion within the 2023 to 2026 time frame and $1.06 billion approved in years 2027 and beyond. The 2023 fall SCBA report addresses administration's recommend, recommended adjustments to the capital budget for tax supported operations. Adjustments to the Blatchford and downtown district energy utility budgets are brought forward in separate reports to council directed through utility committee. Next slide. The 2023 fall SCBA as proposed recommends an $88.9 million increase to the city's overall capital budget. The table on this slide includes the recommended in private discussion of 8 million and shows the categorization of all other adjustments and significant projects included in each one. 23.8 million in the 19 new profiles recommended for funding, including the downtown arena renewal, Northern Lights and South Haven Cemetery phase 1B. A complete list of recommended capital profiles is included in attachment seven of the fall 2023 SCBA report. A 57.8 million increase to scope changes, including affordable housing land acquisition and site development and the Petrolia housing complex demolition. Recosting increases resulting in a net increase of 0 0.3 million, primarily attributed to the relocation of fire station number eight. Recosting decreases or releases resulting in a net $1.2 million reduction to the approved capital budget and transfers from operating to capital resulting in a net $0.2 million increase in the approved capital budget. The net result of all proposed adjustments recommended in attachment six and 10 of the fall SCBA report are $88.9 million increase to the city's approved capital budget. The most significant item contributing to the net increase is the addition of $22.9 million to fund year two of profile 19-90-4100 affordable housing land acquisition and site development. Year one of a total four year request of $91.7 million was funded as part of the 23 to 26 capital budget. Next slide. 
The next few slides will walk council through changes the city's corporate funding pool. The corporate funding is a term used to describe funding sources used primarily for capital to have, that have very few constraints. It consists of four funding sources. Pay-as-you-go funding, which is a combination of investment earnings and tax levy directed towards capital. Municipal Sustainability Initiative, or MSI funding, which is a provincial grant. The Local Government Fiscal Framework, or LGFF funding, which is another provincial grant that will replace MSI program in 2024. And the Canada Community Building Fund, or CCBF, which is an annual grant from the federal government. Funds are held in the corporate funding pool to address future budget needs and, emerge, and manage emerging items. Negative balances should be avoided. Next slide, please. After the approval of the spring SCBA, the corporate funding pool was in a negative balance of $10.1 million. This balance consisted entirely as pay up pay as you go. The 2023 Q2 investment earnings update increased pay as you go by $61.4 million. The result is the positive balance in the corporate funding pool of $51.3 million prior to consideration of the recommendations in the fall 2023 SCBA. As part of the SCBA report, administration is recommending a total increase of $13.3 million to the corporate pay-as-you-go funding pool as follows. A, a library pay-as-you-go adjustment released $12.3 million and release of funding from the Heritage Valley District Park project of $1 million. In addition, administration is recommending the use of $52.2 million of corporate funding towards ad adjustments recommended in the fall SCBA. Funding year two of profile 19-90-4100 affordable housing land acquisition at $22.9 million. Funding renewal items with high risk scores totaling 10.6 million. Petrolia housing complex demolition at $5.9 million. School site development and design at 4.8 million. And an in private discussion at 8 million. Assuming approved Approval of the recommendation in this report, the corporate funding pool would be in a positive balance of $12.4 million consisting entirely of pay-as-you-go. Administration recommends the corporate funding pool balance be held to address future budget challenges such as unfunded renewal projects and emergent funding items. An overall corporate, pool, corporate funding pool balances are included in attachment 8 of the fall SCBA report. In the 2023 to 2026 capital budget, the ideal renewal investment was identified as $3.5 billion. However, the, fund, the available funding for renewal was only 54% of the ideal requirement. Once renewal programs with constrained funding, such as neighborhood renewal and bridges were considered, the remainder of the renewal program was funded at only 30.7% of the ideal investment. While the capital budget made the most of the available funding, this level of funding is not sufficient to maintain assets and crea may create issues of sustainability in the long term. Continuing un continued underinvestment in renewal can impact the condition of city assets, including shortening the asset lifespan, creating urgent maintenance needs and causing service disruptions. For the fall 2023 SCBA, administration identified unfunded renewal projects with significant risks. Risks will be measured in terms of impact and probability. The complete risk matrix and its definitions can be found in attachment four of the fall SCBA report. The fall 2023 report recommends funding the 2024 portion of the renewal projects identified as having high risk scores of eight or nine. The total recommended funding is 15.3 million with 10.6 million of, from corporate funding pool and 4.7 from the LRT reserve. Current strategies for addressing the renewal short fund include right-sizing our asset inventory and a new dedicated renewal fund as outlined in attachment three of the fall supplemental operating budget adjustment report and outlined in the SOBA presentation. Should council choose to fund the preferred scenario, it would result in a 0% tax levy for 2024 and 0.25% increase in both 2025 and 2026. That concludes our presentation. We look forward to working with you through the process to amend the budget to find a balance between addressing our financial pressures, taxpayers' tolerances for increases, and Edmontonians' expectations for service and infrastructure. Thank you for your attention, and we're happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you so much for the presentation. Appreciate it, Kent. And uh, now we'll go to questions, Councillor Nack. Okay, uh, please sign up, uh, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for the presentation and the report again. Um, so can I just, uh, I was trying to kind of figure out how to add, kind of add up all the numbers to 88.9. Um, and I think that slide you have uh, looking at adjustments <clears throat> after the investment income and then funding subsequent, assuming everything is approved is 12.4. I guess I'm just like, what happens to, you know, there's 52.2 at 88.9. What happens to the rest of that 88.9? I think we're a little bit unsure what your question is. So I think you know you're recommending 89 million increase to total of the four year capital budget after looking through all the sources and uh, the investment income um, and assuming all recommendations for this fall adjustment is approved. There remains positive 12.4 million. Um, Okay, right. we get it now. Sorry, apologies. Yeah, no, it's okay. So I'm adding up those numbers and I'm like, it's not 88.9 or maybe I'm not adding it right. So if you can just kind of walk me through that. So we have a list of what adds up to the 88.9. Right. I'll maybe turn it to Jody for this. So if you look at the one slide, there was $8 million for the in private discussion. There's a total of new profiles recommended for funding, which includes the downtown arena, the cemeteries phase one and a few others, which is a total of 23.8. There's yeah. some scope changes. So affordable housing, unfunded renewal projects and for that have high risk as well as petrolia demolition. That is a total of 58.7. Recosting, yep. there's some increases and decreases. The increases are 0 0.3, the decreases are 1.2, and then there's some transfers from operating to capital. The total of all of those is 88.9. Yep. Right, no, I get that. And so how does that show up on the, on the slide six? Okay, I, I think I see, so on slide six, what we're going through is we're going through the changes to um, the corporate pool. And so some of the adjustments here are already funded from other profiles. And what you see okay. on slide six is the amount of the corporate pool funding that's being allocated to the 88.9 and the 12.4 okay. that that's left that continues to be unallocated. Yes, so for my, I, okay, that, thank you. And so there, there will be no implication for the 2024 tax levy um, given this structure. That's correct. Okay, and if, I mean, unless we, you know, approve to go with the renewal fund and whatnot, right? Correct. And and this is spread out over the uh, the next, three years there is a portion that goes beyond into the 2027 right. and beyond right um and then i guess so just uh, to confirm the strategy for addressing that shortfall it's we're recommending both price sizing and the new dedicated renewal fund we have not made a recommendation because we were asked to bring back the op options and what it would look like Okay, but th these are the options. We either go with none, both, or one of them is for future discussion. Yeah, I think the only thing we would say recommendation is in the deferred revenue report, there were a number of options and we did say that if you were gonna go with an option, the universal one would be the preferred. Right, okay. Um, and then just, uh, there's a few mentioned costs coming up and then those adjustments will only are funding 2024 portions. Um, and so I just wanna understand, you know, are we future proofing now outside of those OP12 and planning for the potential risk and scope changes? 
We will continue to monitor all of those as we move forward. And so right now we funded the 2024 because that's what we had available funding for. As we move forward into 2025, 2026, we will continue to monitor those and make adjustments as funding becomes available. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Dan. Councillor Wright. Thank you. I'm just wondering about the um, the LGFF and, and sort of relate that to the MSI. How much over the past five years, how much has that reduced in what we've received? I, I think we'd have to, I have an older report with that in it. I don't have it at my fingertips. Oh, okay, so thanks. if I can circulate that, that would. Because a lot of that would, or, or the purpose of that is like for our infrastructure, right? So would that cover our, the, the renewals of those, um, those high risk facilities and that? No, so when we calculate the shortfall for renewal, yeah. we have already calculated it, assuming that we receive the LGFF as currently approved by the government of Alberta. But that, but that LGFF funding, that's one of the purposes is to use that for that, that's that infrastructure. Yeah, it, it, it's very flexible. We can use it for new infrastructure. We can use it for renewal. Okay, okay. And then I'm just wondering how, how we, got to some of those at high risk scores of eight like um, I'm just wondering like what's what's the recommendation that we should be taking care of these properties at like at what level at six or three or? no we, we funded anything that was ace that scored an eight or higher which meant that it was you know fairly imminent or likely to happen and then the impact would be would be fairly high it would either be severe or considered disastrous so we looked at those that were of the absolute highest risk of something actually happening. Okay, and, but what, at what level should we be, should we be taking care of it? Like what's recommended before it falls into more uh, disrepair, I guess. I guess I would say like when we give you the ideal renewal number, that is, the, that is when we calculate ideal renewal, we're giving you the amount that we think is needed at the time that we believe it's needed. Okay. Okay, before it gets worse. Okay, thank you. And since I have a couple minutes, I missed a couple on operating. Can I just, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> There'll be plenty it. of opportunities. I'll do it by email, thank yes. you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Cardinal. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the report. Just a few questions. I just want to confirm, first of all, that the 19 new capital profiles are really just separating out of uh, larger funding envelopes, is that correct? They're not new things, they're, they're... Correct, it's just a reallocation from one profile into standalone. Okay, and in a similar way, I, I, so I uh, appreciate that you've identified some very critical maintenance things that need to be invested in. Has there been an analysis on things that might be deferred or might be delayed? Not so much on the maintenance side, but maybe on the new capital side. And I know that that can be a bit of a circular argument if you delay a project and save you know some of the debt service for a year or two you also run the risk of cost escalation but has there been a sort of an analysis of things that have not started yet that might wait yeah councillor we did a pretty in-depth version of that last for the four-year budget i don't believe we've done one since um, and you may recall when we did that last year there wasn't a lot of room or opportunity when we did the four-year budget. I would say, if anything, that opportunity has just reduced. Yeah. I, but, but we haven't done a formal sort of a year down the road assessment like we did last year in the four-year budget. Okay, I'm, I would tend to agree, but I'm just wondering if it's worth just a, a relook at that. Um, there is mention of Beaver Hills and Michael Fair Parks, and I believe those are CRL projects, and there was a motion passed last week to re-examine CRL stuff in February. So wondering about the timing on that. Not that they shouldn't go ahead, but they should not go ahead tomorrow. They should wait. Is that your understanding as well? Hi, Councillor Carmel. It's Nicole Wolf. Um, we've got tendering for those in March, so we have ample time to have that decision at Council. Perfect. That's fine. Okay. Uh, one last one. I really hesitate to ask this because it's kind of nitpicky, but I'm wondering about the 1% for art and what that applies to. Because 1% of $10 billion is a big number, but I'm not sure it's on a $10 million aggregate budget. 
but I'm wondering what it is. You're wondering at the total value of what yeah, the total, for art is? the total aggregate, because by and large, generally speaking, we borrow for new capital, which means we're borrowing for that 1% for art. So I'm wondering what the aggregate number might be and if it's meaningful or not. I don't want to, I don't want to cancel it, but I'm wondering about diminishing it. I don't have it at my fingertips. We could absolutely get you that number. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, appreciated the report. I was actually very surprised by how few cost increases there were, just given inflation, given those pressures. So I think that's that's a positive note. Just wondering sort of what, what led to that and what we're anticipating, like if we anticipate this holding out until our spring SOBA. I think, so you're asking, like, could we defer any of this to the spring SOBA? No, 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 just, Sorry. just like, we didn't seem to, no project seemed to have a cost escalation, which just surprised me given that we hear very frequently about cost escalation. As we find out about cost escalation, we bring them back in, in future SOBAs. At this particular point in time, most, most contracts do, or, or projects do have a bit of a contingency, so we will make sure that we're utilizing everything we possibly can before we come back seeking additional funds. Okay, great. So and you won't necessarily see some of those until all of the projects are tendered. Right. Okay. No, thank you. So that's, I mean, that's just good to know that there is that, um, that mitigation that we have in place that, that helps in moments like this where we have the contingency to address that. Uh, I was just noticing the unfunded uh, package for the LRT tunnel intruder system. Was that assessed through the risk matrix? And I'm assuming it scored below an eight then. Yes, it was scored and it, yeah, it would have, it would have gone, come below. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just maybe with the um, hydrogen buses, just wondering if we could talk through the relationship between the satellite transit garage facility and, and these new hydrogen buses and how that relates to our other capital profile for hydrogen buses for the other garage. Again, is there any way that, yeah, like can we, can we use some of the funding from the, the new garage to put some of the buses into this garage? How does that, how does that all work? Yeah, I could take that one. I think the the, the growth of the hydrogen vehicles are um, wouldn't be in the satellite facility. Uh, they would be allocated at our Centennial Garage, where this profile actually includes upgrades to the Centennial Garage, where the housing of those vehicles would be, and then we would be moving some of the diesel buses out into the the satellite uh, growth facility. Okay, so on, in attachment nine for the growth hydrogen buses. It says an unfunded capital profile to purchase transit buses to grow the fleet as part of the leasing of satellite transit facility. So that's that's not, but yeah, so it seems to say that it is hydrogen buses for the satellite facility. I think that is contingent on council's decisions. So as we look forward, it could be, there's it's a myriad of, of, of options with these, these profiles. Obviously going hydrogen is uh, significantly more expensive than if you were to do diesel or hybrid vehicles. Um, so I think that's a discussion point we'd have to have okay, in terms of how we approach that. Sure, sure. And maybe going back to your original point too, so so if the satellite facility, if we move forward with that, um, we would have fleet that could move in there without needing to purchase these buses? We, would, we wouldn't need to purchase more uh, space unless we were doing that. So gotcha. we, like, if okay. we're purchasing more vehicles, space is a premium right now. So obviously if we, we purchase more vehicles, we need more space to put them. If we don't uh, purchase more vehicles, then there's no need to increase the, the, the facility, the, this, the footprint. Great, okay, thank you. Just in terms of the, um, you know, looking at the renewal reserve or the renewal levy, I'm just wondering when we do the operating cost of capital, do we factor in a reserve allocation? No, when we look at operating impacts of capital, we look at it on the, as the specific piece of infrastructure comes on board, whether it's through transit, fire, whatever, we look at the, the specific and then what would it cost to operate it. We don't look at. Yeah, what I'm thinking, you know, again, I appreciate that that wouldn't address our, our renewal deficit at this point, but just moving forward, I think I'm specifically thinking around buildings, you know, a lot of, um, you know, 
you know, affordable housing buildings, for example, there are requirements that they have a reserve policy, 3% of revenues every year go, go into that. I know not all our buildings generate revenue, but have we looked at that sort of forward-looking policy This we're building up reserves for the new assets that we're bringing online now? I would say we look at that holistically in terms of our funding plans. I think I think the thing that we would think about is if every time we approve a capital project, what we need what we need to understand and do is make sure that we can budget for the maintenance of, of that over the life. But if we start taking operating impacts with a reserve contribution, holding a reserve, um, we're st it doesn't necessarily solve the the shortfall problem that we have now. And so we're trying to look at it holistically rather than accumulating funds for the future when we need those funds to spend against something now. So we're trying to find the way to solve the problem over the, the term. I'm out of time, but thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Jans. Yeah, I just wanted to understand um, better, and maybe this could be a memo, but could we get a list of all of the capital investment that council has, previous councils have provided to the Edmonton police over the last, uh, say, two capital budgets? Because I'm, I'm looking through and I'm like, oh, radios, body armor, this sounds really important, but then I wonder why wasn't it funded previously or what decisions were made? So radio, like if I just use, like we can do that, we can, yeah. we can get you that information. Uh, radios and body armor have a useful life. And so even though they appear on the capital side, um, they do need to be swapped out mm -hmm. on a, a somewhat frequent basis. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking like they decided to buy, you know, other equipment uh, or uh, I'm even looking at, say, the rent, we put money into, say, the renovation of the, like, there's an opportunity cost to everything and a ranking. And that's what I'm trying to understand, like, why why we're being asked for certain things. Like, what's the runtime on, say, a truck for the police versus a truck for help? Or what's the runtime for that B benchmarked against, say, the RCMP? Like, we have to fund the police adequately. I do not disagree. But are we gold plating or silver plating in some areas? And that's that's what I'm trying to understand. And you probably don't have that at your fingertips. Yeah, like, I, I think some of those questions are probably best directed at the commission. But we ask those questions what is the life of your radios? Do you need your radios now? What against is, against what comparators? What I don't know that we would do a comp so if I just use radios for example, I believe there's an expiry to radios. If I'm correct, I'm going to let Jody talk. Yeah, there is an expiry to radios, and then there's also just like the wear and tear that happens, like for sure, right? And so there needs to be kind of that cyclical renewal. Sorry, against. Of Against which peers, though, like the RCMP or who? Because when I hear from other cops in a juris other jurisdictions, they're like, wow, Edmonton has the best stuff. And I'm like, so are we the best against Calgary or the best against Winnipeg? Or I really think these are, I don't think we're going to be able to answer these questions. I think these are questions you have to answer, ask of the commission. We can tell you that we ask questions around, is it necessary? Do you need the radios now? and we work with them on that, but I, but, but we and don't do any benchmarking. So it's up to them, they say yes or no. So you ask them, do you need this, and they say yes. It's and as it relates to things like body armor, there's actually vendor, like it, there's a useful life that the vendor will say, it's kind of like a best before date, right? So body armor is one of those things, and I believe they've already extended in some cases on things like radios beyond on that, but again, that's probably sure. something more yeah. clarification for the commission. Yeah, so. but So they had larger yeah. asks, they had, asks of us, we ask them to do their asks with our methodology mm -hmm. on what is urgent and what is necessary and score it the same way. And we only funded what scored as imminent. Based on our own methodology. And I guess what that's I'm trying correct. to understand is like, that's great, but that's not a fair position to put you into. Because that's that's like if you were, um, like the, the police come forward and say, we're going to buy this thing. And we just have to take their word for it. We don't really have a, well, why don't you buy that thing or that thing instead or something. We don't have kind of a trust but verify. I think the Police Act has some clear lines. I'm not sure that that is within our role. For sure, but under the Police Act, like we have to fund adequately, but what I'm trying to get to is the defining of adequately. Like, 
So you define yeah. that with the commission, I believe. Yeah, yeah and that's. I, I believe that it really is the role of the commission, Councillor, and, and like, I don't go to the meetings, but I certainly understand that they scrub through these requests before they get to us from a commission perspective. Mm -hmm. and that's what they did last year. And, and they'll be coming to us. Uh, they'll be coming to council. For sure. for, but, yeah, but even, they'll come even and answer the, and, and I think, you know, we'll see them on the 21st of November. I think that's a really great time to ask those kind of questions. I mean, I, and people always talk about the tanks and the planes and the helicopters and the big ticket stuff, but even little things like when you see a help team driving a brand new $100,000 truck, like, why can't they drive a, you know, a, a Mazda? Why do they need the new truck? Like it's it's that kind of stuff. Like it, and not just for the vehicle, but then the fuel costs, the insurance, all the other compounding factors that come in. Like what's wrong with you know, old, other older cars? Why do we need the new cars every two years? That's the and and not just cars, but very expensive, fuel consuming trucks because that's a. And when I look at other, I was looking. I sent the. I sent you the Calgary info, but I'm looking at other police jurisdictions and it just seems like we are spending money on things and not other things. And it's really hard as a decision maker to sit here and just, unless we just want to rubber stamp that. And I don't think that's what we yeah, want and to I, do. I don't think we rubber stamp and I don't think council's being asked to rubber stamp. I really think those are great questions yeah. for the commission when they're here on the 21st. That's yeah. kind of their role. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Rutherford. Yeah, not too many questions on the capital side. Um, though I did have one, and, and again, just recognizing there's a lot that we're sifting through, so if I've missed this, please direct me to it. So I know you have the the new profile for the 132 Ave uh, re reconstruction from Fort Road to 97th Street at 52.9 million, correct? It's the top one on page three of attachment three. That is, that is correct, Councillor Rutherford. Okay, what is, the, what is the cost for the profile composition for 132 AB from 97th Street to 127th Street? Has that already been broken out in a previous uh, budget? For the previously approved one, I believe it is $42.8 million for the other side. $42.8 million plus $52.9 million for the entirety of the road? That is correct. Does that seem high to any, like, I'm just, I'm genuinely, like, not being pedantic, but for road reconstruction, that seems pretty, pretty substantive. So That's be almost. mindful it is 7.3 kilometers of roadway and it is yeah. eight lanes of what is existing. So it is a substantial okay. amount of infrastructure that we are replacing. But, you know, you, one would say it almost adds up to $100 million just for that one section of road. That's, that is correct. Okay. Interesting. Okay. That's, that's something I need to take away and think about. Um, the other thing that I was a little bit interested in is... And, I, and again, I'm sorry if I was supposed to, the, 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 the investments back into the capital was great. But one of the things that I noticed is there was about 14 million we're paying in like administrative and service fees. That seemed really high to me. When you look at the percentage of our, of our cause it was like, we, we have 61 we're reinvesting back, but there was another 14 million or something that, and I'm sorry, I don't know the exact page that it was on right now. That, we are using for administrative costs and essentially management of those portfolios. That seemed really high. That didn't seem like the best percent return. So don't necessarily, if we don't have the answer today, that's fine. So I think the remaining, the, you're talking about 4.6 million. Um, over 2024 to 2026 is used for financial service charges such as bank fees and administrative costs yes. as well as interest transferred to various interest earning reserves. Okay. So what is that in line with like industry standard or are we paying a premium as a municipality on that service? Are we getting the most out of those investments is basically what I'm trying to get at. So if we have a, renew, we have, we have a renewal deficit and we're contemplating a, a renewal levy, can I turn to Edmontonians and say we've maximized everything to its full potential before considering this? 
So we just, uh, uh, like, let me just use the interest on, that we allocate out to reserves on example. So when we get that, it, it solidifies the purchasing power of the funding. Mm -hmm. And so I guess like I'm, I'm like, I'm it's unclear on whether, if you're asking of whether that's, it just whether that's high. a value. It, it just seemed high. Maybe it's, again, I know I'm in capital, but I think it, they, they interplay. Uh, maybe it's an OP12 con consideration then that needs to... We can take that away and look at it. We can take that, but okay, so I just want to confirm 12.4 million is unallocated pay-as-you-go. That's correct. And administration is recommending that we don't use that because likely you're going to do the same risk assessment for 2025 that you did for the renewal projects in 2024 and want to have that, that money uh, for forecasting that there will likely be some things that are going to be in that same risk category in 2025. That's correct. Okay. Thanks. That helps. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We'll stop here then because uh, we only have three minutes before uh, noon and uh, we'll take a break and we'll be back at 1.30. Until then, we are on the recess.
Cool. Ready? <clears throat> yes, completely ready. Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order. Roll call, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Paquette is away. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel will be coming in right away. Councillor Rice. Uh, good afternoon. And Councillor Jan. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel is here too. All right, questions on the capital budget. And Councillor Prince Bay, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a question about uh, the profile that um, Councillor Rutherford was speaking of, the one on 132 Avenue. Uh, it's a standalone profile. I just wanted to know if that would be one of the profiles that would be considered in the um, $100 million for uh, the acceleration of the bike lanes. Hi, Councillor Principe. No, the bike lane acceleration is different funding. This is out of the neighborhood renewal profile. Okay, so it would not be considered in that. All right, and then uh, I do have a question uh, again on 132 Avenue. It shows 95, I, I believe it's percentage renewal and 5% growth, correct? I believe that's correct. Okay, so um, can you explain to me uh, like what the 5% growth por portion is? Does that, like can you explain it to me? I don't know if I would have all the details today, but we do have items in there like LID for drainage with EPCOR, and we've got um, some of those other types of assets that we're adding in that haven't been there before. Other than that, it's really about the renewal of the corridor um, with the cross section and implementing complete streets and city plan associated to it. So the, the renewal, uh, the growth aspect is very minor in nature and, and those types of elements. Okay, so would the bike lanes be included in growth? I would have to double check on that. Okay, because currently there are not bike lanes there. That is correct. Okay, if you could get me that information it, so that I'll know if it's a, a part of the growth profile or part of renewal. And I just wanted to clarify, it's under neighborhood renewal, but it's only one road being renewed through multiple neighborhoods, correct? Yes, neighborhood renewal policy includes collector roads as well as local roads. So this is a collector road that falls underneath that. Okay, so it's not to say that the neighborhoods will be renewed, just that one road would be. Correct. Okay. Uh, and okay, thank you. Uh, my other questions were answered. Thank you. Thank you, Constance Principal, Constance Salvador. Yep, thank you so much. Um, just on the strategies for addressing the renewal shortfall, um, I guess right now for for renewal, we're sort of, I don't want to use the term ad hoc, but like as, as uh, assets deteriorate and fall into sort of that high risk category, we're addressing them on an as needed basis, if you will. Um, this year, 15.3 million, um, I guess if we look at uh, where we're trending, I guess, have we seen an acceleration of that? Is it sort of a steady state where we're around that $15 million mark? Is it dependent year over year? Is it completely like unpredictable? Like I, just trying to get a handle on that um, as we contemplate the, the renewal levy. I think we're seeing some constant growth, like as our infrastructure ages, we're seeing more and more going into the DNF condition, which is why we were suggesting bringing forward a, a dedicated renewal so that we can address those that are highest need, because we are seeing, if the, the longer it takes us to start investing, the more we're gonna see uh, our assets going into DNF condition. Okay, and then logistically, if, if a dedicated levy were to be introduced, um, when would we be able to start, uh, I guess, allocating those dollars towards renewal? Does it need to hit a certain threshold? Or like if we start putting, putting dollars away in 2025, 2026, will it, will it start helping immediately, I guess? Or does it need to reach a critical threshold? 
I think once we see it starting to come in, like we would put it in in 2025, we're not going to see money until probably the, like into 2026. So then we can start allocating out as it comes, but it's every year it's going to build. And so then we're going to get more and more um, opportunities with that funding, but it's going to take a while in order, like I said, it's going to be 18 years before it's fully funded. So it's going to take a while to ramp up, but as it's ramping up, we can allocate some dollars. Yes. Okay. Um, and sorry, what would the 15.3 million work out to? For a percentage, roughly? In tax levy? Yes. Just under 1%. Because value of 1% yeah. is about 19, 19 million. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's helpful. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Prinsby, can you take the chair, please? Sure, I'll Thank take you. the chair. On the, uh, on the uh, Rogers Place uh, Arena, um, Reserve is that is the reserve funded through CRL or is it a tax levy reserve? I believe the reserve is funded uh, by the operator um, on ticket sales. Like, oh, so okay. yeah, yeah, ticket okay. tax. So ticket Sorry. revenue goes into the reserve, then that reserve is used to uh, for uh, whatever uh, uh, renewal is required. It's a one point five million dollar over here, Mayor. So it's a Harm, speaking of oh. sorry, it's a $1.5 million ticket store charge that goes into the reserve annually. Okay, got it. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's uh, on the, uh, uh, when we build infrastructure, say Yellowhead Expansion, LRT, we always acquire properties, right? And uh, do we have a good understanding of properties that could be surplus, because, uh, or not for city purposes, such as for affordable housing or anything, right? So uh, when do we have that kind of understanding if there's ways to divest in those properties and use the proceeds for either into capital or into a one-time opportunities? When, 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 that, when does that happen? First of all, understanding how many properties do we have? I don't know. So when it comes to like for like LRT, for example, there's additional survey work that is required uh, on related activities. So well, we wouldn't really determine whether or not it's surplus until we've actually done all of the work that needs to be done as far as what the ongoing um, requirements would be. So the evaluation would provide a, a clearer understanding of the land that's available for sale and the corresponding timelines to surplus. But at this point, we don't have any specific items or parcels of land that we would be able to turn around and sell until all of the survey work is done. And maybe I'll just speak generally. So generally when we acquire land for a capital project at yeah. the end of the project, we release any surplus lands. The teams look at what can be surplus, but it has been our practice to take LRT, the proceeds from LRT surplus lands and put it, invest it back into the next leg of the LRT. I believe that's been our process. Oh, I see. So that would be the process for future, say, Southeast LRT surplus land or West LRT surplus land will go to, say, Castle Downs, right, for example. Yeah, but like we, we put it back into a project of a similar, we've been, for LRT specifically, we've been putting surplus lands back into LRT. Okay, got it, got it, okay. Uh, Okay, I, on the, uh, I just want to confirm on the, uh, uh, the commitment that was made to allocate resources toward housing money, right? So we were able to get some in 2023, and you're proposing to allocate a certain amount in 2024. And we would still have a gap over next 25, 26, right? That's correct. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, so th that's about it for me uh, this time. Yeah. Uh, I think any other questions? Uh, I think that concludes the, uh, I'll take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Okay, uh, that concludes the questions. Uh, and we will carry on with our third presentation on the, uh, on the carbon budget. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Council. So the carbon budget. Carbon budget is presented for information to augment capital and operating budget decisions. 
and we see it as a tool that shows the greenhouse gas impacts of budget requests to help council to weigh climate change impacts when making their financial decisions through budget. The fall carbon budget updates uh, in include qualitative and where possible quantitative assessments of the greenhouse gas emission impacts within the proposed 2023 fall supplemental capital operating and utilities budget adjustments. It also includes assessments of the impacts of the decisions made in the spring uh, SOBA. The carbon budget also allows the city to measure the track and track progress against Edmonton's emissions targets so we know how we're doing and what we need to change as we move forward. Overall, the results of the proposed fall 2023 capital operating utility budget adjustments are not significantly improving nor contributing to current emission levels and the majority of significant climate issues that were funded in the 23 to 26 budget cycle remain in the carpet budget and are not impacted significantly by any of these adjustments being submitted this fall. So I think some of those positive decisions will continue to be reinforced in this proposed budget. Some of the proposed adjustments are to fund growth with net zero impact on GHG emissions. And now I'll turn it over to Alberto Altamirano to walk you through the remainder of the detailed presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Andre. Oh, sorry. Um, as reported in the November 1st Climate Strategies Update, the community emissions for Edmonton in 2022 were calculated to be 16.1 million tons of CO2 equivalents. This slide shows the proportional greenhouse gas footprints of the community and corporation. As you can see, the city of Edmonton's corporate emissions represent about 1.5% of the community emissions. It is important to note that while our footprint, when compared with the community footprint, is very small, the impact of our decisions is not, as it can influence the community's ability to reduce their, carb their carbon footprint. The chart also shows the impact thresholds that the carbon budget uses to assess direct and indirect emission impacts of budgetary requests. Next slide. Based on annual emission reduction targets, Edmonton's community emissions were targeted to be 14.2 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent or less in 2022. This target was not met as 2022 community emissions in Edmonton were calculated to be 16.1 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. As a result of this adjusted forecast, the year when the community carbon budget is forecasted to be depleted is now 2036, one year earlier than forecasted in the 2023-2026 carbon budget. This shift is not caused by any of the budgetary decisions made over the past year, but is primarily due to 2022 emissions being higher than expected because of increases in energy use in buildings and the industrial and transportation sectors. These sectors were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and their emissions have increased as pandemic recovery continues. This accelerated timeline also applies to the corporate carbon budget, which is now forecasted to be depleted in 2032 instead of 2033. Um, this table shows the fall 2023 unfunded capital profiles with quantifiable GHG impacts. The impacts of all these unfunded profiles fall within the immaterial magnitude rating as they are under 100 tons of CO2 equivalents or are emission neutral. The Northern Lights and South Haven projects include small emission reductions due to tree planting. The Blatchford Fire Station Relocation Capital Project will result in zero emissions because it is a new building that is emission neutral and therefore not contributing to additional emissions. The Edmonton, the Edmonton Expo Rehabilitation Project is a solar project. While not having direct impacts on corporate GHG emissions, solar PV provides other benefits to the city. It contributes to the carbonizing the grid, leads to decreases in electricity demand from the grid, and reduces costs for the city by reducing the need to purchase electricity. The potential purchase of hydrogen buses would support transit service growth without increasing emissions. Also not shown but worth mentioning are the funding transfers to support vehicle requests for the important work of the Human Centered Engagement and Liaison Partnership, HELP, and Healthy Streets Operation Center. These fleet growth updates consist of 16 hybrid vehicles and two internal combust combustion engines in alignment with the city's commitment to a greener fleet, which was included and quantified in the 2023-2026 carbon budget. The approved 2023 spring SCBA also had a minimal impact on the carbon budget. However, one significant adjustment in the carbon budget was required because of the transfer of funding from the Kinsman Sports, Sports Center Rehabilitation Project to the Peter Hemingway Fitness and Leisure Center Rehabilitation Project. 
this change resulted in the associated emissions reduction of 700 tons previously accounted for in the 2023-2026 carbon budget being added back to the forecast in this fall update. For context, the current estate emissions forecast for the corporation is 247,000 annual tons, annual tons of CO2 equivalents. The carbon budget and accounting framework are still in the early stages of their implementation at the city. As our carbon budgeting processes continue to be improved upon, our focus will be to integrate carbon accounting in the day-to-day -day corporate processes and the decision making at the city. This concludes our carbon budget presentation. We would like to thank you for including the carbon budget information as you consider this fall's budget adjustments and we look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, now we will go to questions from uh, council members. Councillor uh, Nack, you exempted that you want to start or want to wait for them? Okay. All right, as we sign up. Okay, here you go, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciated this one and uh, interesting to see uh, sort of the evolution and um, early early days of this really important body of work. Um, I guess a few a few questions. So I always find the distinction between the community emissions and the corporate corporate emissions quite quite fascinating, um, but also it raises questions in my mind around you know when we're making investments in public transit, for example, um, is that a corporate emission or a community emission? That would go to community emissions. It would be, yes. okay. So if we're making investments specifically in like hydrogen buses or specific technologies, is that still community emissions? It would impact both, yes. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I'm also wondering, you know, there's sort of a, just the lagging nature of some of the investments that, that we're making in climate action, um, not necessarily gonna see those results right away. It takes, takes years to come to fruition. Uh, so with the, 367, the correct number, 376, 376 million uh, that we invested into climate action um, during this budget cycle. I guess, can we, can we expect to see adjustments made to the forecast because of those types of investments or is the scale of investment needed just so massive that that's not necessarily going to change things? Um, it is reflected. Um, and uh, it, it does change our forecast. Uh, but yes, uh, significantly more investment would be required to really move that, uh, that gap. Okay. Um, and then I noticed that a number, actually many of the profiles, um, the GHG emissions impacts were not, not quantified. Is that just, I guess difficulty with pinning a number on it, or can you can you explain a little bit as to why those weren't quantified? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, at this stage, we we can't quantify every single uh, thing. We just don't necessarily track or collect the necessary information to um, to quantify all all aspects, and that's why we use a mix of quantifiable and and, uh, and qualitative assessments. Um, but whenever possible, we do include that information. Right, right. Okay, and then just a final question. Um, recognizing we are still in your early stages of implementation, uh, I guess learnings, opportunities for improvement uh, at this stage going forward? Yeah, um, as we move through, we wanna, we wanna really work closely with um, the folks in IAS, for example, that uh, own the PDM model um, and embed the carbon framework um, as pro projects progress through the, the capital processes, um, as well as uh, there's initiatives in many other areas to include uh, the GHG impacts uh, as part of assessments, um, including council reports and, and, uh, and other types of business cases and memos, yes. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much for the report. Um, I may, maybe I'll pick up there from a methodology perspective. Um, so it sounds like you talking to uh, IAS was a really uh, key key thing for you to do. But I was curious how this time around compared to a year ago for the four year budget, anything you did that's different from a methodology perspective? Um, yeah, the, the qualitative framework 
uh, was improved upon, um, not majorly, but a small adjustment based on some recommendations from eTrack and other, uh, and other areas just on um, how we account for projects that are not necessarily, we, we would just say before that they have no impact, but now we're more clear on there's no impact because they actually don't have the capacity to impact emissions or there's no impact because um, we're missing an opportunity to impact. So um, we kind of clarified that and, and that there's, there's a little bit of word, wording on that in the, in the attachment for, for the council report. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And then uh, I think a year ago when we when this was first introduced, you know, there's not a lot of um, other jurisdictions doing this kind of work. I'm wondering if a year later you're finding um, there's more tools and research and anal uh, analysis out there um, at your discretion to keep refining uh, what we're doing here. Yeah, um, I think it, it is definitely an area that has a lot of interest and um other municipalities are very interested in what we've done so far and, and have reached out and uh, we have been sharing um, tools and information. We've been uh, contacted by universities in the states that are kind of looking at uh, carbon accounting and, and initiatives like that. So uh, there, is, there is a wealth of, uh, of things out there and I think as just the global community uh, moves forward with making this uh, more, uh, a, a more standardized framework, uh, we'll, we're definitely keeping an eye on anything that comes up there that we can use uh, in our internal processes. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then for that Kingsman item, um, so if, if my understanding of how you explain it, if, if, if I understand correctly, um, by, you know, by, trans, by budget being transferred to other rehabilitation projects, there's just less opportunity here for retrofitting, for example, this facility and hence higher uh, emission. Yeah, so um, in the previous year's budget, there was an assessment of greenhouse gas reductions uh, attached to the Kingsman uh, rehabilitation project uh, because that project was uh, reallocated to the Peter Hemingway uh, for that to proceed. Um, those, those emissions are not going to be realized, so we added that, that back on. Um, the, the Kinsman, the, the Peter Hemingway emissions have been accounted for in the 2023, 20, 26 carbon budget as well. So those are still there, uh, but we just miss out on Kinsman. Gotcha. Um, and then, you know, I'm, you know, I am disappointed that we are going to be depleting this faster than even, even by a year, but still, um, uh, well, that's, you know, that's not the trend we want to see. And you mentioned, you know, or the, in, in the report mentions that a lot of, this is not so much influenced by our budget decisions, but mostly due to emissions higher than forecast. Um, I guess I'm just, you know, what, uh, you know, and we'll continue to keep investing in all aspects as much as we can, but, you know, what, what can the, what else can the city do? You know, um, I recognize a lot of this is transportation. This is a lot of, you know, you know, private industries also, um, contributing to this any 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 thoughts on that um well I, I think we're we're doing a lot um to to um progress our climate resilience and energy transition initiatives um, um there's definitely opportunities out there for more but uh beyond what's outlined in the strategies i don't think that uh, that we have you know further insight I think yeah. the, the only thing that I would add is part of what you're seeing in the um, in the numbers is the pandemic recovery. So part of the increase in the forecast comes from recovering out of the pandemic. And so appreciate that that is maybe a bad news on the carbon budget side. It's probably a good news in general for the community. Um, yeah. But you Sorry, do I'm, have to I'm running out of time, but I, I, would, I think where I was trying to go with is, you know, how can we leverage the carbon budget for conversations and advocacy or, you know, partnership with other sectors? Yeah. Um, anyways, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Thank you. So picking up on that partnership idea, um, I'm just wondering, you'd mentioned about the trees and increasing the tree canopy does have an impact. Um, how many trees would really make an impact? <laughs> Um, 
there's, there's members on the call from the technical team that can probably answer that better. Uh, but it takes a lot of trees for, for, for significant impact. But I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, Giovanni Bruno or Chandra yeah. Tavares are online. Yeah, I can jump in. Re really, the um, kind of the tree count and the nature-based solutions make up a, a fairly small uh, amount of our reductions. I don't have the exact specifics in terms of, you know, how many tons of CO2 each tree or each, you know, um, area or like hectare of trees reduces, but that's some, that's information we could provide if you're interested. Okay, I, I was just wondering, you know, talking about the partnership, you know, can we, you know, get maybe corporate sponsorship to, to help with Root for Trees or anything like that? And, and yeah, would it make any significant difference? So maybe if you can, yeah, just send me an email, that would be great. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, because I'd like to be able to support this ongoing maintenance of trees uh, package as well, too. So that would help. Thank you. Councillor, could mm -hmm. I just add one point, too, that kind of speaks to you, some of what you're asking and the, as well as the previous questions. I, I think what we're wrestling with in all of this is that the current fiscal um, framework for any municipality in this country uh, in what we're living in um, across the country never contemplated climate action. So I think as we hear more about potential fiscal frameworks for municipalities and other orders of government, uh, as we design those, I think what could go a long way is changing the fiscal framework that, so that it's purposely um, done or organized in a way that accounts for climate change. The reality is we're, our, our frameworks don't account for that, so. Yeah, I mean, besides providing you know, the, the services and that that Edmontonians expect, if, if we can derive some other benefit from those expenses too, that would be awesome. And I think this yeah. is one benefit. And I think that's some of the things we're doing and we're, but you know, when you think of retrofits, you know, we have $800 million worth of retrofits. We've got $60 million that we can afford to spend in our current fiscal framework. Unless we all, unless we fundamentally change that fiscal framework, I think we're going to struggle always to make big impacts. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Well, I think sort of more variations on the theme. Really appreciate the report. Uh, great to see it continuing to evolve. I think the the new methodology is a great, great approach. And appreciate the recognition. You know, I think it is important that just no change is also problematic, that we actually need to be reducing. So thank you for that. I think I think what I'm always wanting to see when we see how we're not not on target for meeting our emissions reductions, just sort of what types of investment would help get us more on track. Um, and I, I think there's maybe two different ways we could look at that. Like what I've found really helpful is we've gone through our renewal deficit, our capital renewal deficit is that we have a very clear number attached to it, right? We talk about every year we are under investing in our facilities by you know, 470 million. Is there any way we can do that in terms of attaching a price tag to the carbon deficit, even just starting with our corporate emissions? So I actually think that that is what we tried to do with the climate fund that we brought to executive committee last week in attaching what do we think is the total sum value required for us to be able to do things that are within our control to make an impact on the energy transition strategy and lower the GHG emissions. If I remember correctly, that number was close to 9 billion and it was 2.7 billion for the city's share. Great. So we could we could translate that into um, what that annual need is in terms of getting meeting those objectives. Yes, yes. Anyway, yes. yes. I think I think um, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's a really good uh, good approach, and the, and that analysis has been has been done, which is great. And then, and then, do we ever? Is there ever an opportunity in terms of having sort of specific projects or investments that that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm from your first question. That would be sort of more of the detailed planning for the, how we spend the fund, or is it? you know, these modular pieces that we can add on. Like it's like coming forward as unfunded service packages or, yeah. 
I think what we contemplated in that report was what is the total need? What would we need to do to build a fund that would address the total of $2.7 billion? But then the process to deal with that would be what, what are the things that you need to do most urgently when do you bring them forward as a service package? And what is your funding source, source, which in that report would ideally be some sort of climate fund that was created? Okay, okay perfect. Well, great. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward Council to Stevenson, just, yeah. just to add to that, um, in, in that report, we did show kind of annual funding requirements, and we, we, we didn't go project specific uh, level of detail, but we did show by the pathways um, and some of the action right, items right. within the pathways. So we kept it at that level. If that fund were to be implemented, that's when we would come forward in, in the budget with more details about which specific projects we would we would be investing in. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think that's a way to make it make it more concrete and, and draw that link. I think it's just drawing the link between the, the carbon graphs that we see and then the funding needs that we have just to um, help link those two a bit more. Okay, great, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Constant Stevens, Constant Jans. Thank you for this. Um, did I read that we bought carbon offsets? Um, we buy RECs, uh, so for our electricity, um, we offset our electricity use uh, through purchase of uh, renewal energy credits. How much were they? Um, I have to look. I think maybe Geo has the answer if he can. Six million. Okay. I don't have the cost up offhand, but we purchased enough yeah, to offset all of our electricity um, consumption emissions for 2022. Yeah, it's six million a year is our, is our budget for Rex. Okay, um, I, I would flag to my colleagues, that's something I'd like to look at in terms of like if we could get more of a comprehensive return on investment by putting that say into bus hours of service that um, has a triple bottom line effect or something. Um, I don't know if Edmund has thoughts there. Um, I, I think we'd have to look into. Okay, I can leave that, that there for now. Yeah. The other one, um, when we look at our capital, uh, the corporate uh, offset, uh, the corporate carbon budget, have we factored in around a conversation around right sizing some of our corporate assets? Like I'm just, I'm just wondering. So Scona Pool, we closed Scona Pool. There was a carbon budget for Scona Pool. Then th now it's down to I imagine zero post demolition. Um, have we looked at have we looked at this with other other sites or conversations too? Um, I, I don't believe that the forecast looks at potential sites where we could um, we could reduce. I, I think those are left for the operating. Yeah, I, I I guess I'm trying to because we have this really good chart the talking about and we had these co good conversations about uh, our our buildings and and where we may need to right size and where we may need to look at cost savings, but. I, I hadn't truly contemplated until reading this report some of the carbon savings that may be embedded in some of those too. Yeah, Caltra, I, I would say that it really is an important point and any any infrastructure we divest of um, will reduce the, the footprint for sure. So I think that's a positive thing. Whether we've measured them out and sort of gone through as part of our asset rationalization every building and what the offset would be, um, I don't think so. But I think it's, it is a huge consideration as we consider you know contemplating things like hangar 14 for example and hangar 11 those are big those would be big reductions I think in carbon footprint as as we um, are able to rationalize those assets and get them off our books yeah. and uh, apologies if I missed this in the report is is there a list of um, sort of how we how we calculate some of those buildings is it just uh, per square footage or, or is there is there an attachment I, I failed to read yet like, um, it's not in the attachment, but we can we can so we have that information. Hypothetically, you could tell me what the the whether Lewis Farm no wait uh, Twilligarec or Londonderry or Kinsman actually has which one has the lowest carbon footprint. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, that's correct. We 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 estimate building emissions based off of the electricity and natural gas consumption that's built at those sites. So we could tell you exactly which one has the larger carbon footprint. Okay, um, and finally, in the community, I've noticed people talking more and more about clean air as a proxy for climate change. Like they're talking more about air quality index, uh, um, less about less about carbon, more about air quality. Um, I saw there were some references to this in the preamble, but uh, I saw, we, you know, we have that fantastic toy d device downstairs that does the beautiful art with the air quality. But um, do we do we have some sort of a tracking around different points in the city on air quality as well too? 
Um, Councilor, this is, sorry, Chandra Tamaris uh, online. Uh, there's a number of actual um, monitoring stations that are operated by the Alberta Capital Airshed, so a nonprofit organization made up of municipal members and industry um, who um, undertake air quality monitoring um, on behalf of the province. Um, and then they're able to um, um, produce annual reports on whether or not we're exceeding air quality standards. Um, so yes, so the, the lantern in, in City Hall is tied to the data that comes from those um, stationary air quality monitoring spots. Yes, yeah, specifically like I had received a question from folks along Fox Drive who were worried about with the Twilliger uh, freeway expansion that there's going to be more um, dirty air now coming to them because of that project. So it wasn't just the carbon budget of that project, it's the air quality downstream from that project. There is um, opportunity through the Alberta Capital Airshed to deploy portable monitoring too for specific um, areas or concerns if there are that. But yes, I think air, uh, you know, air quality is something that's um, easy for us to understand as it relates to our um, physical health. So it's, it's a topic we see often in our engagement with the public coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jazz, Councillor Prinsby. Thank sure. you. I so I know we have corporate goals and we have community goals, right? Uh, community goals, we are not doing great, but that's many cases beyond our control. But we do enable people to reduce their emissions by building transportation choices, bike network, public transit, or by changing where people live through zoning regulations, district planning, or uh, you know, 15 minute communities, right? So what I wanna understand is if we only have a certain amount of money, right? What is the most effective use of those resources to reduce the most amount of emissions, right? Do we do that kind of analysis? Because even though we have kind of a two stream approach, one corporate, one community. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the technical team in a second, but uh, it, I, I believe is kind of what Harm was saying earlier is basically we have to tar target it through the different pathways, um, and different pathways give us different efficiencies for for uh, for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, as we progress through projects and as we mature the carbon budget, we w we want to get to the point where we can say this this recommendations have the highest impact, mm -hmm. uh, but right now we're limited to just assessing what, what's kind of coming forward through the through the capital and, and operating projects. Uh, <coughs> right, right. You know, for example, you know, we could invest $2 billion in the LRT project, or we can invest $2 billion in bus network, or we could invest half a billion dollar in other sustainable modes of active modes of transportation. So that kind of analysis is probably not not, not. I mean, you could maybe make assumptions, but that kind of a data. Yeah, and and they're also not necessarily completely independent of one another. Right. You do housing, but if you are tied to good L, good LRT system, for example, then that you know maximizes. Uh, so the integrate the integration yeah. of integration uh, different modes sure. of okay, got it. Okay, uh, on the on the bus purchases, are we? moving toward emission, zero emission neutral buses? Or I know Eddie had to go, right? Uh, maybe someone else can ask, ask that question. Uh, yes, that's the plan. So uh, we're actively working on energy transition and looking at uh, all of the different alternatives, including uh, hydrogen fuel cell is the next one that we'd like to focus on. Yeah, but all we, we also, we also had that plan, Kerry, where you do midlife refurbishments of diesel buses, right? So we have numerous diesel buses that haven't lived their full life yet, uh, uh, but mid-refurbishment still is, how does that work in that uh, emission, zero emission plan then? Yeah, so the challenge there is just the size of our fleet. So we have a renewal uh, deficit because we're only at 24% of funding um, so we have to prolong the life as best we can until we can replace them. So it's through replacements and growth 
that we're able to make that transition. Um, but in the meantime, we've got to make sure that we can get service on the road, uh, which involves that, that midlife refurb uh, for the older buses. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here. I have other questions, but I think we'll ask those when we get into more specific around uh, emissions. Uh, okay. Uh, with that, I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Thank you. And I would like to welcome students from Joey Moss School, Grade 6 class, joining us from Ward Vihisawan. Right? Counselor uh, Cartmel is your counselor, and they are here with the uh, their teacher, Mr. A. Swoboda, right? Here we go. You know, Joey Moss was a remarkable, remarkable Edmontonian. Mm -hmm. And we miss him dearly. He was just, he'll bring joy. He used to bring joy to hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of people through his charming personality and his, uh, such a, his positivity. I, I remember him meeting a few times and it was a remarkable, a remarkable individual. Good. Nice to see you all. I met your uh, rest of your uh, other, uh, uh, you know, rest of your class. I think they're doing a mock council. Have you done your mock council already? Yeah. What were you talking about? City buses. City buses. Mm -hmm. Who was the mayor? Me. Okay, you tell me what you're talking about. Oh, if public transit should be free. All right, Councillor Paquette is not joining us today. He's away from something, but he'll, he'll have a very strong perspective on that, right? So, yeah, cool. Thank you. So, so let us know what you decide, okay? Send us an email what your decision was and what the, what the arguments were in favor and what were the arguments in opposition, right? So let us know, okay? Nice to see you. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, so that concludes the questions on the uh, carbon budget, right? And that was one round of questions for each, right? And uh, uh, we, on the private attachments, I think we'll get to them. This this was opportunity for clarifying questions, right? So. Uh, when we get into detailed budget, there'll be an opportunity for us to go in camera and ask more detailed questions on, on those specific items. So the next step is to kind of postpone these? Yeah, if you what? Could, yeah I was going to say receive for information, but too <laughs> soon. Maybe if we could postpone these all over to the next council meeting, which would be on the 21st of November. So need a motion and yes, then... Yes, please. Okay. So moved. Second. Second by Councillor Hamilton. Okay. Okay, so please vote. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor. I'm a yes as well. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rice? Yeah, I'm yes. I didn't see pop up on my screen. Okay, thank you very much. We have all the votes, Mersohi. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So 7-1, seven, 7-2, one, seven, seven, 3 7 4 is first item tomorrow at 9 one, 1.30, sorry. Oh, is, is it 9.30, right? The anti-racism tomorrow? Yes, that's correct. Okay, okay got it. So if we could move now to item 7.6. No. 7.6, 7 .6. 2023 false supplemental capital and operating budget adjustments deliberation process exempted by Councillor Wright. And are there any re remarks? Yeah, or we actually present? would like to give a presentation. Go so if ahead, you could please. just let Chris change seats and he can sit next to Kristen. We've got a short presentation to remind everybody of the process. Okay. Are you ready, Mersohi? 
We are ready. Okay, I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Chris Martin, who is going to do the presentation. Chris, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Christopher Martin. I'm the Manager of Governance and Legislative Services in the Office of the City Clerk. I'm joined today by my colleagues Aileen Giesberg, City Clerk, and Kristen Stolars, Director of Governance and Legislative Services. Representatives from Financial and Corporate Services are also present to answer questions where needed. We are here to present information on the 2023 Fall Supplemental Capital and Operating Budget Adjustment Deliberation Process. Next slide. Today's presentation includes, one, the flow of the November 21st City Council budget meeting, two, the deliberation process, and three, the approach for dealing with budget amendments. Next slide. The flow of the November 21st, 2023 City Council budget meeting will be as follows. Administration may provide brief additional remarks. Council may ask questions of administration. Civic agencies and external organizations with funding requests will also be available to answer questions. Council will then deal with the supplemental budgets in the following order, capital budget, operating budget, utility budget, carbon, or carbon budgets, then utility budget. Next slide. The deliberation process is, Council will move and second the recommendation, also called the main motion, for the capital budget adjustment. Council will ask questions of administration. All amendments will be moved, seconded, and postponed. If required, Council may take a short recess after all amendments are moved, seconded, and postponed to ensure all amendments have been recorded accurately and for any necessary preparatory work. The randomization process will be completed afterwards and it will be used to determine the order in which amendments will be dealt with. Capital budget amendments will be debated and voted on. Then, the same will be repeated for capital budget adjustment. That is, Council will move and second the recommendation, also called the main motion, for the operating budget adjustment. Council will ask questions of administration. All amendments will be moved, seconded, and postponed. If required, Council may take a short recess after all amendments are moved, seconded, and postponed to ensure all amendments have been recorded accurately. Again, the random pro randomization process will be completed to determine the order in which amendments will be dealt with. Operating budget amendments will be debated and voted on. Next slide. After all amendments are dealt with, Council will deal with the carbon and utility budgets. Council will deal with the capital and operating budget main motions as amended, and then Council will deal with any related bylaws. Council may also deal with any subsequent motions. Next slide. The randomization process is the same as was approved for the 2023-2026 budget deliberations. The randomization process will be used after amendments have been moved, seconded, and postponed, and a new randomization draw will be used for each budget. Next slide. As a reminder, the randomization process is as follows. A random draw is used to determine the order in which councillors make amendments. The mayor is not a part of the randomization process and is permitted to make multi-part amendments that include decreases and increases, and council votes on the mayor's amendments first. Councillors will be assigned a number of 1 to 12 based on the random draw. Councillors introduce amendments based on the draw order. Budget decreases will be dealt with before budget increases. Amendments are debated and voted on. Rounds are repeated until all amendments are dealt with for each budget. And to finish today's presentation, the Office of the City Clerk is preparing to support councillors and their offices in drafting motions for the budget meetings. We're happy to take any questions on that and the overall deliberation process. Next slide. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction of the process. And now we'll go to questions from colleagues. Councillor Wright, you exempted this? Go ahead, please. Yeah, I just thought it was good for the, the public to get an overview of of how the process worked. Um, but I'll, I will just ask a question um, in regards to offering sessions before November 21st um, with councillors' offices. Um, so that means with the staff or with the councillors or with both? Or? Yeah, the intent was to be with your staff and, and with yourselves. So okay. it would be open to whomever might be working on drafting anything. Okay, perfect. Um, did I have anything else? Um, and the, the addendum... Um, or the attachment that's that's with it, um, then that's the process that the mayor. Yeah, attachment on. one details out the randomization process, and that's the same as was uh, used last year. Okay, awesome. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford. 
Yeah, I, I wasn't going to ask any questions, but since it was selected, I, I guess one of the things that I have a question about is this: is this typical for a budget adjustment? Because I think when I read this process, it sounds like we're going to re-debate an entire budget. It sounds like a very similar process to what we did for a four-year budget, but this is meant to be a supplemental budget adjustment. This is not a process that we've ever used for a supplementary budget adjustment in the past. So what is predicating us using this now? This was the process that was approved last year and that we were requested to bring forward again. You were requested by council, okay. It just seems like we're gonna re-debate a lot of things that were already debated. And so I guess one of my questions then on the process piece, if something was brought forward during the four-year budget and failed, can it be brought back? So any, any amendments that were made last year during the budget that failed um, can still be made this year. The budget is a dynamic document, yeah. and so what amendments failed last year, yes, they absolutely can be brought forward because the request would be to amend or take different action. Okay. I will leave it there for now. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you very much for this explanation. Um, so, can you just remind me what we did our first year of adjustment? There was still a random, I remember there's still a randomization process, right? Yes. And then this last one was just much more random. It was more, I'm sorry, Councillor Tang, it was more what, sorry? It's just much more random. There's a few, few more layers of randomization. Well, and the mayor was not part of the process. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to understand, so, so, so we're each going to draw the, we're going to each draw a number out of the hat, and then we're going to put the, our amendments on the table, uh, table, it, table it, and then we're going to come back um, after everything's on the table, it will be randomized, and then we're going to come back and go through the amendments through you know, like a listed process or, or a, a randomized list and we're going to go through them one at a time and then we're going to vote. Right, there's a tabling stage and then there's a debate stage. Yes, that's right, Councillor Tang. So uh, if you'll remember from last year, uh, the advice is that everyone states their amendments for a budget so that there's clarity on uh, what the intentions are and then we essentially put the or they're essentially put on the floor and then we come back or not put on the floor they're stated and then we you come back with the randomization process which tells you who's up between 1 and 12 and that's when you do the, the debate, debate yeah. and the vote yep and then Last year, I remember there was also kind of sort of towards the end, I think more so with operating, we got a chance to kind of review everything of like, okay, these are the ones that passed and this is an impact. And we've had a bit of a, a last round of assessment and made some adjustments there, I think. is it, I don't necessarily see that in the steps outlined here. Are you referring to the, um, the impacts between the two budgets? Well, I think it's just the impact on the tax levy. I think at the very end, we just got a, like a, you know, okay, here are the ones that passed, here are the ones that didn't pass for the, you know, let's say that all these unfunded service packages that are now approved, this is a total impact on the tax levy now, but then we still had a bit of an opportunity to review and make further adjustment, I guess. If we didn't like it, and, and so I just want that's a bit of a last step there. I just want to know if that was still like we'll still have that opportunity. So, Councilor Tang, that wasn't actually in the council approved oh. original process or in the revised process. However, that was a, an action that the chair asked us to take once finance had had a chance to calculate everything that had been passed. And it's a good practice to just take a pause before you're voting on the main motion to make sure that you've got all the information and everybody understands the implications before voting. Right, right. Okay, so so we could very well do that at the end of, let's say, step two, right? 
Yes. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tang. Councilor Stevenson. Yes. Thank you. Really appreciate the the overview in terms of the support uh, for drafting motions. Will we have the Google form that we had previously? Yeah, your individual Google forms. Yes. That's the. Or sorry. No, I'm going to back up. Not a Google form. What we will be doing is providing a Google document for um, to you to collect all of the amendments, subsequent motions in one document. We will provide, uh, plan to provide samples of, um, of each of, say, an amendment to the capital budget, an amendment to the operating budget adjustment, uh, as well as um, some prompts in terms of what type of details are required for a valid motion. Great. Okay. Thank you. That was it. Thank you. So that concludes the question. Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to, oh, sorry. trying to buzz in. Oh, sorry. Councillor uh, Gans? Yeah, I was just wondering. So um, looking at the process here, why is it important that we vote on the main motion? You mean after it's been amended? Yeah. It's a requirement. But it seems like kind of a formality, right? I never anticipate I know the outcome of any vote of council until it's actually been voted on. So what happens if we vote, go through the budget, but then don't don't pass the main motion? What do you, what like do you I think mean? last time, I think five councillors voted against the operating budget. That's pretty close to seven. Two more vote against the operating budget, then seven vote against it. What happens? We, we implement the budget we have today, because it's a four-year budget. Interesting. Yeah. So it's an automatic approval, effectively. Yeah, but you could also, as a council, you could go right back to the table and start all over again. So your two options, if the main motions don't pass, is that you do nothing more, don't meet any more, and we, we just execute the budget we have, or you agree to come back and start all over again, which is not in the timeline for the 29th of November. Interesting. So, so we legal we if if nothing gets decided, we legally have a budget that we can execute for the next three years. Because, like politically, there's great benefit of being able to vote for things, add them to the budget, but then when the bill comes due, say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm I don't support that," and it just seems like this process sets up that kind of theater, for lack of a better word. Democracy. It, uh, does, democracy I, I yeah. Does, do administration have any suggestions on how we could avoid that kind of well, theater? The only thing that I would say is the budget, so we we put out our recommendations, you adjust them through, through a series of motion. Voting on the main motion lets you understand the cumulative impact of your collective decisions. And at any point, then you can decide whether you reconsider. It, that's interesting. So we could vote on everything, get to the main motion and say, it's still too high, we want to go back and check something out. In, in capital and operating, is that right? Or am I wrong? Sorry, like I'm just explaining what yeah. I think the rationale is for why you, why, and I defer to the clerk sign process, but why as a group of people, yeah. you might want to look, you might want to have one last look before you decide what your budget is. Right. And so let's let's play with that then. What does that one last look look like? So just to be really clear, you can only give a direction to administration by motion. Understands, voting on amendments doesn't do anything. All it does is adjust the main motion. You already give the last direction you gave to administration on the budget stands. Is the okay? Which is the four year cap? The four year capital operating and carbon everything. Got it. Okay. And of course, the difficulty of implementing that. It's right. based on the context we've provided because then I have to essentially absorb all those right. context increases that we're dealing with. So that's, that becomes a challenge and I will probably do that. You may not like how it's done, right? Yeah. So. I mean, I've, I've heard about it in other municipalities, not ours, that sometimes it causes tension on council where councillors vote against a budget but then gladly show up to the ribbon cutting and gladly show up to the, the event and, and then it's seen as you have it both ways. So I don't know, has the administration reviewed code of conduct or something like that that could be included? Like like if, if say... We I, have not, Councillor, and I think that, that is more of a conversation for Council to have. Yeah, I think it's mm -hmm. more Council Services Council conversation, yeah. right? Not administration or... We, 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 haven't do, we haven't done that in yeah. this context. We haven't been asked to do that, and I think, you know... 
Well, this has been illuminating. I thank you all very much. Thank you, Councillor Chance. Councillor Principal, can you take a chair? Sure, I'll I just take the chair. need to completely understand that aspect, Andre. Like, if through the process, at the end of the process, Council decides not to approve the budget, you have 4.97, six based budget approved last year. Correct. And I have a whole bunch more pressures than yes, I Yes, you last do. Year. Yeah. But what I want to understand is that then you will act based on 4.97 approved budget with the direction from council what was approved within that money. Correct. But you will not be acting on things that are addition to that, which is 2.13%, which is police funding, settlement cost, utility cost, and others. So you will not be acting upon those because those have not been approved by council. Well, council they, has not approved the budget related to those items. I can't go back on arbitration, but so what do we do with that? Yeah, you would have to, like if council doesn't give you the money for the decision that we made, no, I think now that the settlement, like you're asking about the arbitrated settlement, right? Arbitration, all, yeah, all, if it's all, been all arbitrated, we need to pay it. Yeah, but all And so if you don't want to give that money to police, then I guess you don't give that money to police and it's either we have to figure out a way to get the money to police or they, I guess, need to reduce the number of officers in order to have the money yeah. to settle. No, but I'm trying to understand, Stacey, that the... 4.97% or 96%, we gave approval with certain things to be done with that money, right, as part of the process. Then during this year's process, we added more, some out of control, some we made decisions on, such as settlement, such as the funding formula. So what I want to understand, if the budget doesn't go through, then how could you, how could we, how would you perceive as a direction from council to do things that we have not approved through a budget process? I, yeah, I think it kind of depends on the piece. And some of this, I think we would like on arbitrations in particular, I'd rather talk about that in private, what our options would yes. be. But because I think, you know, yeah. the, the reality in that case is you would have um, not have approved budget for things that we are legally required to do based yeah. on the agreements right. it, we've, it we've entered whole, into, right? It so, creates a whole, bunch of, whole yeah. bunch of so many other So I think there's a, co there's a combination of it puts us in at risk in terms of our legal obligations to pay for things that we've committed to publicly and, and in, in agreements. I think the other is, on, on some of the other things, it could just be as simple as, you know, uh, might be a bigger variance or... Yeah. deficit following year right? yeah so either I think, way yeah. I don't I think it's important yeah. that we have a budget and yeah. it's adjusted I, I agree with you I think that's why I'm, I'm reason asking these questions because I've been I've been reflecting quite a bit on our process this is not anybody's uh, like it's not this is the process what we have followed I think because process creates uh, I think it becomes lack of there's a lack of accountability on uh, on the decision-making process, right? So I think that's what I'm kind of thinking about, right? It's okay. This is yeah. not yours. Like, it's not your problem. This is council's problem. I think we need to figure yeah. out a better process. But, but I think it's fair to say that when you make decisions throughout the year yeah. on things like arbitration and funding yeah. formulas and, and transit commitments and things like that, you, you are creating something that you should anticipate paying the, for the bill yes. when it comes to budget time. Yes. And if you decide not to do that, then it does provide problems yes. for the corporation, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Got it. Okay, good. Yeah. Because I asked that question when we approved the funding formula. I asked, where's the budget attached to funding formula, right? And uh, we, were, we were told we will deal with that during SOBA, right? I think that's a dis disjointed on a uh, process that doesn't foster accountability, right? So, okay. anyways, uh, I will take the chair back. I'll return the chair. And I'll go to Councilor Carmel. Great, thank you. So, uh, I feel like this is straying a little bit from the part of the budget conversation we're having today, so I'm not going to tease this out too much farther, but um, building on Councillor Janja's questions, I guess I, I want to test this with you, Mr. Kerbold. It was always my understanding, and frankly the instruction I saw, that while there may be fierce debate about what we decide here as Council, that once it's decided, it's essentially Council's duty or responsibility to at least be factual about those decisions and support them. 
to some degree. Is that is that fair? Do you, yeah, I believe. Like I always say, I don't. From from my perspective, in terms of what I implement, it doesn't matter if it's a thirteen zero or a six, seven six vote. I implement what council's democratic decision is. I and I, you know, so I get what Councilor Evans is saying that you know you potentially someone wants to participate in the celebration when they didn't support the project in the first place. So I'm going to go to the LRT celebration just a few days ago. Now, that decision was made before I got on council, before that particular leg, but I have not been particularly supportive of the West LRT leg, and I stand by my concerns there. But I felt a duty, particularly on the Southeast leg, to show my support for that project, to encourage people to use it, to show that it was safe, to say that, you know, whether we all liked those decisions or not, we have it now, we bought it now, we ought to use it now. Do you think that has value? Maybe it doesn't have value. Maybe maybe if I didn't vote for it, I should just stay home. I, I, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. I know that there's a, there's a political underpinning that, of the question being asked, but do you, does your administration, do, does ridership flow when you hear concerns in the community about will the pillars crack or will a bridge collapse? Or I, I, get, I guess from my perspective, it has value for council to get behind its decisions um, collectively as a group. Yes, I believe that to be true. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Wright, you want to move the recommendation? Sure, but then can I have, have another round of questions? Yeah, move the okay. recommendation and ask questions. Okay, um, so I move um, receive for information of the 2020... No, 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 no. recommendation. Oh, Is sorry, the, the recommendation on the 2023 fall supplemental capital and operating budget adjustments deliberation process. Okay. okay. Second. Second by Councillor Nack. Okay, we have motion on the floor now. Okay, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Okay, I... I just wanted to go back to when Councillor Tang was asking about the sort of what seemed to be a long drawn out process. Um, but we don't have to go through all those rounds, right? <laughs> you don't have to make any adjustments. <laughs> and, but and but then it seemed to sort of uh, grow from there. So, um, and, and I would add, Councillor Wright, given that this is a budget adjustment, the, what we set up in terms of allocation of time, logistics to prepare for this process, we do not anticipate anywhere near the amount of amendments that were, you know, put on the floor, created, debated, all those things. And if that is what were to happen at this adjustment, we would have to, we would run out of time, I think. So. Okay. And, and if it goes beyond what we've got till the 29th scheduled for this, if there was not a decision made by that time? I would defer to the chair and council to decide what they wanted to do at that point. Okay, and then um, so the two options that you gave us was you would if it if it failed was to either just execute the existing budget or to start all over again. So does that mean that then you would have to go back away and spend your Christmas holidays to come back with a new budget in January? It, it depends on how far apart we are. I would say at that point. Uh, I think the other point to understand is um, the stability of these processes processes and what we get by certain dates and if we can't pass a main motion could impact things like independent ratings of our financial things like the CD how for example right they, they look to stability of processes as well as part of their assessment so. okay okay that's all I have thank you thank you Councillor. so we have a pro oh, sorry motion on the floor anyone to speak seeing oops uh, sorry, Councillor Rutherford, you want to speak? Yes. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, yeah, sorry, I do just want to quickly speak to this. I, I appreciate, I, I am moving close. I appreciate Councillor Wright's last comments about, you know, do we, do we have to do this? I think, you know, we absolutely have to give this due diligence based on what Edmontonians expect, but I do want to recognize that, like, for me, that I hope that we also have a lot of restraint in the kind of things that we're putting on on the floor um, with this kind of tight budget. Um, I also do want to say that um, I appreciate the questions around the process from last year. 
uh, I do feel that um, there was many things that I didn't agree with in both the capital and operating budget. I said no, I voted no to them during the process, but still ultimately supported the budget. Um, this year with 1.63% of the budget being police, a funding formula that, that I didn't support, if I'm seeing that it is going that way, that there, we're not gonna have a high level of support for the budget, I don't know if I will support the budget either. So I do want to let those counselors know that that goodwill is maybe not going to exist this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Anyone else to speak? To close, Councillor Reid. I'll just say it's a good process. I hope we don't have to drag it out as, uh, as, as long as it is. And I, and I think we have made decisions along the way throughout the year, and we know what the impact's gonna be on the budget. And even though there are some things that came up as a surprise, well, utility costs shouldn't have been a surprise. They're, they're rising everywhere. Um, but I just do hope that we can come to a, a final decision by the 29th so that we don't have to send it back to start all over again. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So please vote. We're just waiting for one more vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, okay, we are on to, that was seven six. Seven seven wasn't selected. On to 7.8, advocacy for funding towards downtown public infrastructure projects and the residential incentive program exempted by Councillor uh, Rutherford. This was a recommendation from Urban Planning Committee, and I'll go to Chair Stevenson to make the introduction, introductory remarks, please. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a full day last week talking about uh, different approaches to supporting residential development in the downtown, uh, looking at different tools and different funding sources for how we could encourage both office conversions and new residential developments. Uh, the main outcomes were um, directing administration to look at ways to streamline development approvals process, which uh, is moving forward and we will have a report back by memo. Uh, there were also three additional motions made, um, two regarding uh, direct financial incentives and one regarding advocacy with other orders of government. Um, so seeking their support um, as many other municipalities across the country are, are asking for, adding our voice to that as well. I will leave it there. Thank you. So what is in front of us today at Council is the, uh, the, about the uh, advocacy to the other orders of government. Uh, my understand motion one, two, and three were passed by the committee did not require to come to council. So I would say questions will remain focused on the, uh, mm -hmm. on the advocacy part. Good, good. Okay, uh, consider the first one, please. Is the motion going on the floor? Oh yes, please. Happy, happy to move. Thank that, you. Um, oh, apologies. that the mayor on behalf of city council advocate to other orders of government for funding towards downtown public infrastructure projects and residential incentive programs such as new purpose-built rentals, office conversions, and other related developments. Okay, thank you. We need a seconder. Second. Mr. Nack, give me a motion yeah. on the floor. Now questions. So yeah, floor. at the committee meeting, which I'm a member of, I did ask if there was anybody from InterGov that was at the committee and there was nobody at that at committee that was able to answer some questions I had about this particular motion um, related to some of our prioritization. So that is why I selected this today to see is there somebody from InterGov that I can ask questions to on this motion. Councilor Rutherford, Mike Vivian here from Intergovernmental Affairs. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, I guess before I ask too many questions, I, <clears throat> I want to know what because I, th it's murky in my mind what we've talked about in public. And so do we need to go into private to ask some of these questions about our strategy around advocacy? I would certainly recommend that, Councillor. Um, and in fact, um, 
I would say this is some, some of this is also on our intergov update that we're that is on the agenda as well okay. this week. So do you think that this should just wait until after that? Like, should we postpone this item until after that intergov update? I think that might be helpful, or we just go into private to discuss this well, item and let's just, let's one way or the smooth. other. Let's make it smooth if we could postpone this yeah. one. That and would, then I could ask yeah. those questions. I think that's a good idea. We have a couple of insights we're presenting that Perfect. related to that. That would help. I yeah. Think. Okay. I just, I, otherwise, I mean, if, if council does want to vote on this, I would still have to say no at this point. I don't want to have to say no, but I yeah. do have some questions. So. I think good idea is to have that intergovernmental update. That will, sh you'll share some pr perspectives uh, on this, right? Clear, and uh, provide all okay. the clarity you need then. So, sure. uh, yeah, so those are my questions. So yeah. we, what would the process be? Uh, uh, yeah, I would just say if you postpone this till tomorrow and then it can be dealt with after item 9.1. Okay, you need someone to move that, right? That'd be great, thanks. Okay. I, I can move that. Okay, second. Second. Councilor Salvador. Okay, please vote. I'm um, yes. Yeah, we're just sending the vote out right now, but thank you, Councilor Rice. Just waiting for one more vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. All right, that is carried. So we will deal with that. Uh, bylaws are dealt with in camera. I'll move we go in private, subject to uh, section 16, 25, and 27 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act to deal with item 9.3. Second. Okay. Okay, please vote. We have all the vote. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we'll take a five minute break. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
eight. Uh, bylaws are done. Uh, Nine point one for tomorrow. And sorry, the uh, and uh, seven point four is for tomorrow. That's it. Other than uh, notes of motions and motions with our customer, uh, sorry, uh, pending motions, which uh, we usually deal at the end of uh, end of the agenda. They usually are at the end of the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we we established that order earlier on that we won't bump them; that they should always be the last item, right? So, yeah. We've got one we'd like also to ask council to pass just to cancel a meeting in December, and we'll have that ready for you tomorrow. Okay, so that's it for us. No. Are you gonna? Would you like to pass any motion? Yeah, this one we will accept sure. for uh, information. Sure. But other than are that, we, uh, are we back online? Yes. Yeah, we're back online. The, whatever the motion is related to this, yeah, Councilor Hamilton. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll move that the actions outlined mm -hmm. in attachment one on the report uh, accompanying item 9.3 um, be approved and the employee and legal services report remain private pursuant to section 16, 25, and 27. Need a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councilor Wright. Please vote. Yes. 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 We're just waiting for one more vote. We're just waiting for one more vote. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, display the vote. Here you go. So before we break, can you just quickly let us know what we will start with tomorrow and what the what is on the will be on the list? Yeah, absolutely. So tomorrow morning you're going to start with item 7.4. You're going to start in public, and I do anticipate that there's going to be a need to go in camera. Uh, once you're finished with that item, you're going to deal with item 9.1, which is also an in-camera item. Once you're done with both of those items, there is currently one motion pending, and uh, as I mentioned, we have one motion without customary notice we'd like council to pass, and it's just to cancel a meeting that was already set in your calendar that's been moved. I just don't have authority to cancel the meeting. Okay. So uh, 9.1 will be the second item at 9.30, right? Sorry, Mayor, I didn't hear that. So 9.1 will be the second item at 9.30? Yes, that's okay, correct. Got it, okay. Okay. A All right. Point of order. So then when do we deal with 7.8 then? Afterwards. Okay. After 9.1. 7, 4, 9, 1, 7, 8. Gotcha. Correct. Yeah. There's some information in 9.1 that might be helpful yeah. for 7, 8. Okay. All right. Thank you. We are, till then, we are on the recess.